Please be seated. Good morning. Uh, is is there any preliminary matter before we get started? Anything on the stick? No? You know, I forgot something in my office. I'll be right back. Hold on. Give me a minute or half a minute. Okay, Loretta, you want to bring in the jury? <coughs> and Your Honor, I just had one issue. Hold on, Loretta. Hold on a second. Just one quick issue, Your Honor. Um, Hold on. Sorry. Okay. When I was preparing, Your Honor, um, I was reviewing PTIs for Ms. Dominguez, who's one of the, the defendant's expected witnesses. And I just want to make sure that she was reminded of the limited scope of her testimony because she sure had a lot to say. And the purpose of her testimony is very limited to that one incident of Mace, um, and that was it. Well, a couple of things, if you want to talk about it right now. Uh, the state has asked witnesses <clears throat> if, uh, if, if Mr. Ariola had a gun, if he carried a gun, so they've opened the door to that. They've asked witnesses if Mr. Ariola, uh, or, or elicited testimony that Mr. Ariola was honest, so they've opened the door to that. Um, but I do intend to visit with her. She's coming in about half an hour early uh, to visit with me so that I can talk to her about the scope of her testimony, but uh, we certainly are entitled now to bring a couple of other things out, <clears throat> excuse me, based on the state's questioning and, and the, uh, the evidence uh, that, that has come out. Well, can I respond to the one about the honesty? As okay, you, you know, we're not, we're not going to go into the character, uh, into right. the, his character as to truthfulness. Okay. But we already have. But, uh, Your Honor, as you recall at the bench, I, she, when Ms. Moss brought it up, I said, I didn't elicit that. I want to, I will lead her so she doesn't go into that. And if the, if, the, if the court feels the door has opened, then I'm going to pursue it further with this witness and other witnesses. And I wasn't allowed to do that. Okay, we're not, we're not going to get into the issue of character for truthfulness. Okay, 
But to visit with her before, she's not going to come in right away, right? Oh, no. She's, okay. The, okay. she's not coming till the afternoon, yeah, okay. but obviously they've asked uh, whether or not he had any guns. Uh, she can comment on that. Um, I, I, didn't t I didn't make the state ask that question. Uh, they asked it, so now I, I get to follow well, up that, with my that, witnesses on it. But not, we're not going to get, we'll, we'll discuss this more, but right now I'm telling you we're not going to get into the is issue of his character for two years. Sure, I understand. All right. All right. I've heard you. Okay. Okay. Bring him in, Loretta. Good morning, you may be seated. Okay, uh, defense, you may call your first witness. Thank you. The defense calls Dean Cummings to the stand. Mr. Cummings, come up here. Before you take that seat, what do you You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give the people in the penalty of law. I do. If you get closer to the microphone, you open it. You proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> You need that on yet or not? Uh, not quite yet, but I will soon. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? Uh, my name is Dean Cummings. And how old are you? I'm 57. And do you have any children? I have three beautiful kids. How old are they? Um, they're 9, 17, and 19. And where are you from? I'm from Alaska, Valdez, Alaska. And did you grow up in Alaska? I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico. How long did you live in New Mexico for? Um, until I was 23, 24 years old. Okay. And what, um, where did you move to after you left New Mexico? I moved to Valdez, Alaska. And what were you doing in Valdez, Alaska? I ran a heli skiing business, a guide service. Um, and what does that mean for those of us that aren't really into skiing? I, um, I offered a trip, a helicopter skiing trip. People would book uh, a trip from all over the world and fly into Valdez, Alaska. And we would take them out in helicopters into the mountains and ski them down mountains. And we'd do multiple runs a day. They would sign up for six, six to eight runs a day. And I would book out um, four groups a week and then one private helicopter group. How does a boy from Los Alamos, New Mexico, end up guiding heli ski tours in Alaska? I um, have been I've been a skier my whole life. My dad taught me how to ski when I was in, in kindergarten, and I went on to make the U.S. ski team. And uh, I found my my calling in big mountains and backcountry skiing. I went up to Alaska in '91 and uh, got second place in the World Extreme Skiing Championships. And I had helicopter experience from when I was a younger man. So I was asked by a helicopter company to start a heli ski business, so I did. And so that's what you were doing in Alaska? Exactly. I did other things too. I owned a small gravel pit and I developed 50 acres of property as well. So I was, I was involved with some heavy equipment in the summertime doing operations and then doing helicopter skiing in the wintertime. And when did you leave Alaska? I left Alaska in 2019. And where did you go? I ended up putting an office into Wilson, Wyoming. Um, 
to do helicopter ski bookings. Uh, it was a booking a, a booking office basically. Okay. And did you stay in Wyoming? I did. I was in Wyoming um, until 2020. And where did you go then? Then I came down here to New Mexico. And why did you come back to New Mexico? I was looking at finding um, a place for the summertime um, and the early fall. I'd spend my winters in Alaska and the rest of the year in New Mexico. I was looking for a piece of land. And what were you going to do with that land? I was going to build a house and start doing some hunting guiding. I'm, a, I'm an avid hunter. I live subsistence in Alaska. I'd hunt a moose every year and a mountain goat every year. I'd put away about 500 pounds of meat every year for my family. And so you wanted to do that here in New Mexico? Yeah, I'm, uh, I really enjoy hunting. I'm pretty good at it. And uh, there's a good market for it here in New Mexico. And where were you looking at properties? I was looking um, in the era of Largo Canyon, which is basically everything from uh, San Ysidro all the way to Farmington. I was looking for property in that area. There's just an incredible amount of wildlife and game in those areas, the Camazon area and the Largo Canyon area. And how did you first meet Guillermo Ariola? I was just looking around for a different land and uh, exploring some of the region by Camazon Peak. And I ran into um, five horses. I was also looking to get a horse with a piece of property. And I ran into five um, horses that looked really beautiful. They were look really healthy. And uh, at the same time, I ran into the horses. I, two, two guys came by on horseback, uh, one of the ranchers from the Camazon area, him and his, uh, his, one of his cowboys. And I asked them about the horses, and they told me, yeah, that there's a chance he would sell one of those horses. And uh, I said, well, how do I find this guy? And he said, uh, he just was riding down the road on his horse. We're surprised you didn't see him when you drove, drove down. And so I just took note of it. And then I left, and as I was driving out, I ran into a gentleman on a horse, and I was pretty sure it was going to be the owner of that, the horses in that property. And I stopped and talked to him. And was that Guillermo Ariola? That was. And so tell us a little bit about that first meeting on the road. So I was in my truck. He was on a horseback. He, dis he dismounted off his horse, and we started a conversation at the window of my truck. He went on to tell me more than I was even looking for. Um, I was looking for land, but I didn't think he had land. I just thought he had horses at the time. And he told me he actually didn't have horses, that it was someone else's horses on his property. But he had a chunk of land he was going to sell. He was going to sell a small ranch. And I said, I'd be interested in looking at it. So we uh, decided to, to exchange phone numbers and that we could reconvene at another time so he could show me the property. So you didn't see the property that day? No, we just uh, made it so that we would call each other and schedule a time to come look at the property. Did you make any observations regarding Mr. Ariola's demeanor that day? I did. Um, he did smell like liquor that first time I met him. And uh, as I was about to drive off, he was having a hard time mounting his horse. He couldn't get up on his horse. His horse was kind of dragging him along, and he was trying to climb up on this big old horse. Um, I was my observation that he was he was intoxicated. Okay. When did you next speak with Mr. Ariola? A couple of days after that, we uh, I gave him a phone call, and uh, he was uh, willing to go look at the property as soon as we as soon as he could, which was just a couple of days out with a weekend coming up. So we uh, scheduled a time that I would go out there and meet up with him, and he could show me the property. And did you end up going out there? I did. Tell me about that first day on the ranch. So I drove out there, and there was two gates to go through to get in, into the ranch. I drove through, and the gates were open, which was nice. And I drove on the property, and it was much nicer than I anticipated. It had, like, four really beautiful areas for horse corrals. And then it had uh, land on the side where you could graze the horses. Uh, that was a, some other landowner. But um, we had permission. He had permission to let his horses graze in that area. It was really nice. There was a small trailer. It had a water system, so I had water. Um, he ran uh, solar power for electricity, so it was off the grid. And uh, he was really adamant about showing me um, everything with the water and with the solar panels. Um, he invited that I could come out there and stay there any time, and uh, that way I would get a handle on 
how the water system worked and how the electrical system worked with the solar panels. How did you and Mr. Arioli get along that time? We got along just fine. Um, we seemed to have a lot in common with uh, mountains and deserts and horses and stuff. And so did you see Mr. Arioli again? I did. Um, he invited me to stay there and to use the trailer anytime I wanted. Um, I also talked to him about, I, I let him know that I had a fifth wheel RV camper and that uh, we could do one of two things. I could purchase the property if he was interested in doing that, or I could just live out there and pay him $300 a month in my fifth wheel. I figured I would walk before I ran on this on this deal, get a handle on the property since he was nice enough for me to look to stay out there and get a feel for how the water system worked and how the power system worked. Um, so I ended up uh, staying at the trailer the following weekend, and uh, I explored the region with my with my four wheeler. I had a side by side four wheeler. I went around and explored the mountains and checking out wildlife and stuff like that. And to be clear, Mr. Ariola was aware that you were out there? Yeah, he, uh, he was adamant about me staying out there to learn the water system and the, uh, the electrical system. Okay. So that weekend, that first weekend when you stayed out there, was he with you? No, he wasn't. I had the whole place to myself and I explored the whole region. And after that weekend, did you speak with Mr. Ariola again? I did. Um, I spoke to him again and I told him I was very interested in the land. I had already pulled out my fifth wheel RV, so I was already set up to start paying $300 a month for, for the rental of the spot where my camper sat. But I told him I was very interested in purchasing the property. And I wanna back up a, a, a little bit here, Mr. Cummings. When, can you give us an approximate time frame of when you first met Ari Mr. Ariola on that road that day? I'm not too good with the dates, but um, I'm pretty sure it was it was about three weeks, three and a half weeks before the incident. Um, the incident was at the 29th of February. So I, was, I had uh, met up with him three weeks before the incident occurred. Okay. So you and Mr. Ariola are having conversations about how you can purchase the property or rent the property. Yes, I actually met him one more one time in uh, Placitas at the grocery store, mm -hmm. and we talked further about it. And he was very motivated to sell it, and I was very motivated to buy it. And how were you getting along with him during all of these exchanges? We got along pretty good. We had no problems. Um, we seemed to have a lot in common. Was there a time when that started to change? I ended up staying out there one time when he stayed out there and we did, we did some drinking. We drank a little bit of whiskey mm -hmm. and uh, he went into detail about having problems with his neighbors. Um, he drank more than I did that night and he seemed to really want to share a lot of his history with his neighbors with me. Well, and before we get into the details of that, um, <clears throat> can you kind of explain how it was that the two of you ended up there together? Um, yeah, he, he said he'd come out on a certain weekend that I was there and um, I was excited to learn more about the watering system. So he actually walked me through the whole watering system. We went to where the, where the well was drilled, where the, the containment, the, he had a secondary containment system that it would fill up a, as about a 500 gallon tank. Um, and then he showed me how to, how to irrigate all the trees. He had planted a lot of trees out there and he showed me how to, plant, how to water all the trees out there and then showed me a little bit more about the electrical system with the solar panel. And you mentioned some whiskey. Yeah, we had some whiskey. We drank some liquor um, that night after he showed me everything. Who brought the whiskey? Um, he did. Do you recall how much whiskey you had to drink that night? There was a bottle. I can't remember if it was completely full when we started, but um, I probably had five drinks. And when the bottle was running out, it only had a few more drinks left in it. He seemed to want to finish off that bottle. And he poured a few more drinks than I had my, um, personally. Um, he was definitely liquored up. And you mentioned that he started talking to you about problems he had with his neighbors? Yeah, he started talking I'm about... Right, I'm going to object to hearsay at this point. <clears throat>
All right, so Mr. Cummings, you were saying that Mr. Ariola had uh, started to confide in, confide in you about some problems he had with his neighbors. Specifically, did he tell you about an incident where he attacked a car with a hammer? He did. He told me he had scared Objection, the heck out of somebody. Hold on. By, um, hold on, hold on. He's answered the question. I think that's the scope of your ruling. He, his knowledge is what's, what's relevant, not the details of the incident. You, 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 I don't know if we should be doing this but in open court, but you just said he could testify to that, to this incident. As to that incident only. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cummings, did Mr. Ariola tell you about an incident where he attacked a car with a hammer? He did. He told me he scared the heck out of a guy that had pulled into their driveway, um, the neighbor's driveway, and uh, he had beat on the top of the car, and the guy was scared to death. And how did that make you feel when you heard about that? He shared a few more incidences than that. Um, but how did it make you feel when you heard about that incident? I had a red flag uh, go up immediately. I, um, this, I, I figured out I didn't want to be on his bad side, and uh, I needed to be careful on how I dealt with him to close the land deal. Okay. And how did the evening end? Um, I went and slept in the back room. He showed me where the bunk bed was, and... Uh, we got a couple blankets out of a, a Rubbermaid container, and uh, I fell asleep in the back room, and he uh, slept in where the fireplace is, which is basically the living room of this little trailer. And I'm going to show you what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 46. Is this the back bedroom where you? Yes, it is. And did you sleep on the lower bunk bed or the upper bunk bed? I slept on the lower bunk bed, the one to the looker's right. Are they on now? Mr. Comey. Okay, so now we have the photo up. Which bed did you sleep on? The one to Looker's right with the blue mattress that's showing the mattress under the blanket. And you see that other bed in the back with the uh, boot box on it? Did you ever sleep on that bed? I didn't. And we've heard evidence um, that there was actually a rifle wedged between the mattress and the box springs of that bed. Were you aware that rifle was there? I never did see it. I didn't know it was in there. Okay. Did you see Mr. Ariola again after that evening of drinking out at the ranch? Yeah, we met up another time to go horseback riding. Tell me about that. Um, he, we met out at the ranch again. We had, just, we had uh, scheduled a time to meet up, and he was uh, going to give me one of the horses that was on the ranch with the purchase of the property. So I really wanted to know how everything worked, where the saddle was, where all the bridles were, and uh, he was more than happy to show me everything. He really enjoyed being around horses, I could tell right away. Um, so we saddled up the horses and we rode up the dirt road, probably a couple miles up the dirt road and into a small canyon and then rode back. It was kind of a short ride, mm -hmm. but uh, the horse was, was a great horse. I really enjoyed getting to know that horse. It was uh, perfect for me to have a horse out there, and one that was as big as strong as the one that was out there. And how did the two of you get along during this horseback ride? No, we got along just fine. Did you see Mr. Ariola again after that? Um, I did, but that was the big, the big day. Did you ever meet with him at his office in Placidas? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I sure did. Um, we had scheduled a time to meet in Placidas where he had his realtor, um, and he was going to meet me. He said he had an office in Placidas, and then we scheduled a time where I could go meet the realtor and see the contract. And did you meet up with him? I did. It was hard to find because I didn't know it was a little trailer that he was in. He was in a camping trailer, and I was looking for an office space. Um, 
So I showed up on time, but I couldn't find exactly where they were at. And I finally called him up on the cell phone, and he walked me into where, where I could go into this gated area and go into where this little camper was. And at that point in time during the meeting, did you have a chance to review the contract? I did. I looked at the contract. It was pretty lengthy. I read it from, from front to cover. And uh, the attorney was, uh, Glamour was there, and so was the realtor. Mm -hmm. Did the realtor become irritated with you? She definitely was short with me. Um, she was pushing me to sign the agreement, and um, I wasn't ready to do so. I needed somebody to look at it. It was some of the language in the contract was beyond my scope of law and realty. Okay. Did you ask to take that contract with you? I did. I asked them if I could take the contract to an attorney or to a realtor, and she uh, responded back to me that she can't do that or she could lose her realty license. So what happened after that meeting? That was a pretty big red flag. Um, Guillermo didn't really speak up in the meeting. I could tell that Guillermo was a little bit bugged with his realtor because she wouldn't, wasn't really being very uh, open with the agreement. And um, I, I just ended the meeting right then and there. It was a waste of time at that point. I needed to be able to convince Guillermo that I needed an attorney or a realtor to look at the contract. He seemed a little bit bugged with uh, his attorney, with his realtor too. So did you leave that meeting without signing the contract? I did. I left without signing the contract. Okay. Were you still interested in buying the property? Oh, yeah, I definitely was. And did you speak with Mr. Ariola again after that meeting? Um, yeah, we had another phone conversation, and um, he apologized for what had happened. And uh, I asked him if there was another realtor we could work with or uh, how we could work with the realtor that he had. And did you, did, did the two of you reach an agreement or was it still open for discussion? It was a vague conversation. He didn't go very far into uh, meeting up again with a realtor or finding another realtor. Um, so it was open-ended at that point. Did you return to the property at some point? I did. I uh, went back to the property to stay out there um, again. Were you still hoping to purchase the land? Absolutely. Was Mr. Ariola there when you arrived? No, I got there late one night around 10, 11 o'clock, and uh, nobody was there. So I would uh, put on a, a movie and watched a movie inside the trailer. And what happened that evening? I uh, fell asleep in front of the TV, and then in the middle of the night I woke up, and I smelt a propane smell in the trailer, which concerned me. Why would that concern you? Because propane is flammable. Now, you um, said that Mr. Ariola had spent a lot of time showing you the property and how it worked. How was this trailer heated? With a, with a wood fireplace. What else did they use to heat it? They had a small propane heater in the back bedroom, and uh, he had a couple bottles on the back of the, back of the trailer that were propane bottles. I'm going to show you what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 61. Do you recognize what's depicted in this photo? I do. What is that? It's a propane heater on its side. It looks like it either fell off or uh, somehow tumbled off to the side there. And where is that propane heater? That's in the back bedroom. Was that propane heater supposed to be sitting on the floor like that? If I recall, it was hanging on the wall. I think there's a hanger just outside of this photograph where it was supposed to be hanging. Okay. Do you know how it got on the floor? I'm guessing because we got into an altercation that some one of us bumped into it. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 75. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photo? I do. There's some propane bottles. Where are those propane bottles? They're just on the outside of the back bedroom where the altercation occurred. So now you testified that you woke up in the m middle of the night and you smelled propane. Yeah, I did. Uh, and that concerned you? It did. I was, uh, I was, wasn't. The smell was really bad. It woke me up, basically, and I got up and I was trying to figure out where it was coming from. I checked the stove, but the stove wasn't turned on. 
And at that point, I just went to my trailer because it smelled so bad. And when did you see Mr. Ariola next? I slept in. He showed up around, I don't know what time exactly. It was 1.30 or 2 o'clock, and he pulled into the property in his truck. And where were you when he pulled in? I was in my fifth wheel trailer. I stepped outside when I saw him pull up. And what did you do? I just went to greet him, and uh, we, we, we greeted each other just outside the gate where my fifth wheel RV was parked. Did you notice anything about his demeanor at that point? It was definitely a little bit different than the other times I had met up with him. He was kind of short with me, and um, he kind of had a scowl above his eyes. He, um, he seemed to be in a bad mood is what I thought. He, he just wasn't in a good mood or something. So after you greeted him, what happened? Um, he went over to his trailer. I went back into my fifth wheel, and um, he was moving stuff from inside the from his truck to inside the trailer. He had brought a bunch of gro a bunch of groceries, and was moving stuff into the trailer. So what did you do at that time? So I wanted to have a conversation with him about the purchase of the property, and um, I was thinking things were falling through, but I really wanted to communicate with him to see if we could work a deal. And so I went over to the trailer and went on inside, and he was in the kitchen unloading groceries. And what happened when you went inside the kitchen? I started talking to him about the trailer and about getting someone to look at the agreement, and he was kind of standoffish more than I'd ever seen him. Um, he's behaving differently for sure. And we started talking about it, and it started getting kind of heated. Um, so I, I could tell that our conversation wasn't getting much better at the time. So I wasn't sure what to do, but um, I was just trying to communicate. And how long were you talking to him for? Probably about 10 minutes, uh, eight minutes to 10 minutes. And when you were speaking with him, did he appear intoxicated? He kind of did. Um, I didn't get very close to him. I couldn't smell anything at the time, but... Uh, he definitely, he definitely seemed intoxicated a little bit. I wasn't sure if he had, had been drinking or been smoking some weed or something. And we've heard testimony in this trial that Mr. Ariola was on cocaine at the time of his death. Were you aware that he used cocaine? No, he never shared that with me. He never uh, told me that he used cocaine or tried to share it with me when we were drinking. And so you're having this conversation and it starts to get heated. What happened next? So he gets a pretty bad scowl above his eyes. You could tell he was getting pissed off. And um, I, was getting, I was getting a little anxious too myself. I just really wanted to get, get the deal done and get the contract looked at by an attorney. Um, I started calling him out. I was calling him out saying, look, are you trying to scam me on this deal or what's your problem? Mm -hmm. I kind of maybe went one step too far. To, I didn't realize how angry this guy could be or how he could get that way. When you say that you may have gone one step too far, what do you mean? I called him a scammer, um, and that really blew him off, off the top. That really made him angry. And after you called him a scammer, what did he do? Um, I said, are you scamming me? And he uh, runs across the kitchen. He was only three or four feet away from me at the time. He comes running at me. He has something in his right hand, and he comes at me. He swings at it. I block with my left hand, and he barrels into me with his... Um, his left hand, kind of like a, like a blocker in a football game. It pushed me against the countertop, and I slid off into the hallway. I was on my, on my hands and feet. I'm going to stop you there for a minute, slow you down. Okay. And I'm going to show you what's already been admitted into evidence as State's Exhibit 44. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photo? I do. And what are we looking at? We're looking at the kitchen with the, the start of the hallway. You can see the hallway going off to the left there. And can you tell us where you were standing when Mr. Ariola attacked you? I was standing right there. I think that's where my feet were. My, fleet, my feet were. And when he knocked into you, when he attacked you, where did you go? I fell backward. I landed about where the sunglasses are. And then he was all over me, um, but my rifle was sitting right next to the wall there. 
um, right about there. And I, as he was on top of me, he was trying to swing with the canister or something in his hand. And uh, I reached across with my right hand across my legs and grabbed the rifle. And then I was uh, scooching backward down the hallway, trying to get back up to my feet. And I'm going to stop you there for a okay. minute. So when he tackles you or attacks you in the kitchen, I think you used the word attacked. When he attacks you and you fall to the floor, were you wearing sunglasses? I wasn't. Whose sunglasses are those? They were on his hat. They were uh, Glermo sunglasses. Okay. Do you know how they got on the floor? I think when he came over me, swinging above me, they fell off. So he's swinging at you with a canister? Yeah, I know there was a canister at that time. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was a knife or what he had. Did he ever make contact with you? He never did. I kept blocking him with my left hand. And so after you're on the floor, what happened next? I was doing a crab walk kind of thing, trying to get my feet under me. I got back up to my feet or almost back up to my feet. And he came running down the hallway and hit me again. I fell into the very entrance of a small bathroom. I was kind of in the door jam with my, my legs were in the hallway, but my upper body was in the door jam of the bathroom. Um, he was all over me at this point. He's swinging as hard as you could swing. I'm blocking him as much as I can. I've got the rifle by the barrel and he's trying to grab the barrel and trying to grab the rifle out of my hand. I knew I couldn't let go of that thing for the life of me. Um, I ended up fighting myself back to my feet. I backed up down the hallway. I was about four or five feet from him, and he's just in a rage. He just starts. Let uh, me stop you there. Okay. When you are knocked down the second time, you scramble to get back up, you said? Yeah. And what do you do then? I get it back in the hallway, and I get back about five feet from him. I'm about at the very end of the hallway at this point. I finally grabbed the rifle, like you should, with the handle on, with, with one hand on the handle and another hand on the barrel, which is kind of got a plastic coating around the barrel so it doesn't burn your hand. And I said, stop. And uh, he didn't stop at all. He came charging at me and knocked me into the back bedroom. When you screamed, stop, and you have the rifle, what are you doing with the rifle? I'm trying to protect myself. I'm basically thinking that if I point this at him, he's going to stop coming at me and realize how serious it was. But he didn't. He just came barreling into me. He, he was coming into me like a, like a football blocker, coming with his left hand and his other hand up in the air with, the, with some object in his hand. So after you yell stop and he barrels into you again, what happens? I fall back in the back bedroom, and um, my legs were all the way in the bedroom, um, kind of by that heater where you had showed that heater before. Let me pull it up for you. I'm sure you take Exhibit 61 again. So is, where were you? Does this photo show where you fell? Yeah, kind of. I would say my uh, legs were where the uh, number four is, and my upper body was just out, just outside of this photograph. I was scrambling out from underneath him. He was all over me. He was on top of me, swinging with that thing in his hand, and I was crab walking back again, trying to get my feet back under me. This time, he was all over me, though. He was leaning over me and swinging violently with uh, something in his hand. I'm going to show you a different photo that might help us a little bit in understanding okay. what you're describing. Um, Permission to approach the witness, Your Honor. Yeah, that's, that shows a lot more for sure. That definitely show where I fell. Do you recognize what's depicted in this photo? I do. Is this a fair and accurate representation of this part of the room? It definitely shows the entrance of the bedroom. At this point, we would move for the admission of Defendant's Exhibit R. No objection. It'll be admitted. Permission to publish? You may. So, Mr. Cummings, in this photo, what are we looking at? We're looking at the entrance, uh, the door entrance to the back bedroom and a propane heater. And I don't know how we clear the yellow markings that we had previously made. Put your lower left hand on, the, on, on your screen. Not the, over here. Do I just hit clear here? Oh. 
Thank you. So this is the doorway to the bedroom? It is. And what is in that lower corner? What is, what is this? That's the propane heater. What is this metal bar? It's uh, where you hang the heater on. And so as you're falling into the bedroom, tell me what's happening. He's just all over me. He's totally in a rage. Um, I fall backward into the back bedroom. I start scrambling and trying to get out from underneath him as best I could. I had the rifle in one hand. I had it by the handle at this point because I had picked it up and put it in my hands properly when I was in the, when I got out of the ba bathroom. And um, I'm scrambling right now trying to get away from him and he's, he's swinging as fast, as hard as he can with his right hand. And I'm using my left hand and I'm using the my elbow and my palm of my hand with the gun in my hand pushing off trying to slide myself back out from underneath him and I don't know one of us hit that heater I don't know if it was me or if it was him and when you hit the and one of you hit the heater did it come off the wall I uh, it was too crazy um, I didn't I didn't really pay attention to that part of it but it looks like it did fair enough I'm going to show you again what's been already admitted as States Exhibit 46. Mr. Cummings, do you see in this photo a green area rug? I do, a throw rug. The throw rug, yes. Where was that throw rug before this fight started? It was spread out evenly on the floor, basically where you'd be sitting on that bunk bed with your feet on the, on the carpet. It was laid out on the floor. It wasn't underneath the tote. It was on uh, further this side of the tote, the Rubbermaid container. How did the rug get all pushed up like that? I think I was on top of it. I think uh, part of my body was on top of it. And when I was doing the crab walk, trying to get out from underneath him, I think I pushed it up. So as you're crab walking or pushing back, what is he doing? He's swinging at my head with that, can, with that canister. He even glanced at me a couple times. It was like he was trying to rub it on me or something. But I got a hold of his, I had a hold of his jacket and I was blocking him with my left hand. And who had the gun? Um, I did. And where was the gun? It was in my right hand. And I was using my right hand to walk, try to crab walk away from him and trying to get my feet underneath me and blocking him with my left hand. And was Mr. Ariola touching the gun? He was all over it. He was trying to get it out of my hand. He was pulling on it. And I was hanging on to it for dear life. I didn't want him to get that gun. I knew it was a, would have been the end of me if he got a hold of that gun. And so you say that you knew it would have been the end of you. What is going through your mind while you're fighting over the gun in this bedroom? I just couldn't believe he was this crazy that he would attack me like he did. And I was definitely seriously worried about my life at this time. I knew if he got a hold of that gun that uh, it would have been the end of me or if he would have nailed me in the temple with that, with that canister in his hand. Um, I started thinking about my family and my kids and I said to myself, you're not going to be a father much longer if you don't get serious about what's going on here, Dean. I was basically talking to myself, trying to get... Get, um, get to the point where I can start pulling a trigger. And so what happens when you have that thought? Um, I'm still trying to get up. I think I got up to just uh, about um, in a squat position mm -hmm. and he's all over me. He's got a hold of the gun. I couldn't get it up and uh, he's pushing on the ground. I think he pulled the gun against my fingers is what happened is why the first couple shots went off. Um, once the shots went off, I got my left hand, I took it away from his right hand. And, and I, I want to stop you and I want to talk about those first couple shots. Okay. We've heard evidence and we've seen photos of some impact sites with scorch marks. Yep. Those two impact sites on the floor. Yeah, I saw those. Do you know how those happened? He had a hold of the gun, pushing it down so I couldn't pick it up. And the gun went off. Um, I thought it went off more than two times, but it turns out it was just two times where it shot the floor. I'm pretty sure the barrel was touching the floor when those two shots fired. And after the gun goes off those two times, what happens? I just say to myself, Dean, you got to get serious about this. If you're going to be a father any, any longer, 
I just started, I grabbed the gun with my left hand, I tried picking it up, and he had his hand, he was fighting over my, over me with his, his hands all over that gun, trying to yank it out of my arms, and I just started pulling the trigger, and um, I must have been just a quarter of the way up, not even that, maybe a, um, a quarter to a third of the way up, because all the bullets went through the wall at a horizontal plane. Um, I never really did get that gun up. Okay, so when you when you pulled the trigger, you're saying you're about a third of the way up? Yeah, I think he was all over me with his right hand. I'd given up on his right hand so I could grab the rifle properly. Mm -hmm. And I just started pulling the trigger. And um, I didn't think we shot that many times, but that gun went off a lot of times. And um, what happened when the gun goes off? Um, once the gun went off, um, I, knew, I had the gun went from, from being down low to going up higher and um, he falls at my feet just right where I was right where I was at trying to get up on my feet. Did Mr. Ariola say anything to you during this fight? At the beginning he said I'm gonna kill you that's the first thing he said to me when I fell down in the hallway from the kitchen. Did you believe him? I believed him he was he was in a rage. After the gun goes off and Mr. Ariola falls to the floor, what do you do? I get up to him, I get up all the way and I walk outside and I was choking on something. So I was coughing, I was doing a technique that you do for high mountain, uh, mountaineering, where you and you get, you clear your lungs, you get anything that's in your lungs to come out. And I was, went out, I walked outside through the little mud room, he had a little porch there and I walked outside. And I was kneeling over, um, trying to hack that stuff out of my lungs because I could feel it was that my lungs were kind of seized up a bit. Did you know why your lungs were seizing up? I didn't. I didn't realize uh, that he had anything like mace, um, but I was coughing, and um, I looked over there, and my my face felt really cold, and it was stinging a bit on my face. So I ended up looking over, and there was a water spigot over there to the back of the trailer. I went over there, started splashing water on me. It didn't seem to help much, so I actually went back inside and I looked in to see if, if that guy was still moving or not. He wasn't, and I noticed a canister in his hand, and that's when I was uh, concerned it might have been a chemical of some kind. I went into the, to the kitchen, I got some soap in my hand, in the palm of my hand. I went back outside, I took my shirt off, and I started washing myself um, on the side of my head, washed, it, washed my hair, washed the side of my skin. And then I dried myself up with the towel, with the T-shirt, so my, the T-shirt got all wet, and I was worried the T-shirt had some sort of chemical on it as well. How long did it take for you to uh, recover from the effects of the spray? My skin was stinging quite a while, and I seemed to be able to clear out my lungs. I just kept coughing and doing that technique that you do for high mountain elevation mountaineering, and I got that out of my lungs, but... Uh, it kind of burned for a while um, at that point. I went over to my trailer and I grabbed a shirt. I took the shirt off, I threw it on the bed of my truck. And then I put a new shirt on. It was still chilly, it was winter time. And what did you do with the gun? I put it on the front step. I, I cleared, I took out the clip. I cleared the, the barrel so it wouldn't be around in the barrel. I knew the police were going to be coming. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't a hazardous situation for them and that I wanted them to be able to trust me that they were safe by going into that building. Um, I'm going I, to show you what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 27. Is that where you put your firearm? That is. I set it right there on the step. And did you remove the magazine? I did. I took out the clip and I cleared the magazine out of the barrel. And you did that, you said, because you wanted it to be a safe scene? Yeah, I wanted the police officers to be able to see it so they knew where the weapon was so they could go in and check out the scene. Um, I was just trying to make it as easy as I could for them, and I was definitely kind of worried about what could happen next, so I wanted to make sure they didn't think I was armed. Now let's talk about this firearm for a minute. What type of firearm is this? It's a 5.56 five, um, Sig and Sauer. And why did you buy it? I bought it when uh, they were gonna. They were supposed to be gonna outlaw ARs. I bought it to uh, as an investment. I bought. I bought two of them. I bought. 
a Colt and I bought a Sig and Sauer. I was going to sell them. In Alaska, you can sell guns on a thing called Alaska List. So I was going to just try and double my money on these weapons. And why did you have it out this, at this time? I was going to go Barbary sheep hunting. Uh, New Mexico has a Barbary sheep hunt that's year-round over the counter. And there's Barbary sheep out there by the Kimazon Peaks and out there by Largo Canyon. So I was going to go hunting and see if I could find one of those uh, Barbary sheep. So why was the rifle out in the first place? I had put a new scope on it, and when I mounted it, it wasn't uh, quite right. It wasn't level. So when you look through it, um, you could see that the crosshairs were off angle. So that night I readjusted the scope and made it all level, and that's why I had it there on the table and it's leaned up against the wall. We've seen evidence that there was some electrical tape around the scope. Uh-huh. Why was there electrical tape? I put lens covers on the scope so if it rains, the scope doesn't get wet when you're hunting and or dust, and they just cover it up really good. And it, it was not the tightest fit, so I got some electrical tape, and I stretched out the electrical tape and wrapped it around there. It's really secure stuff. Once you stretch it tight, it's kind of a technique electrician, electricians use to put over wiring and stuff like that. Was the cap to the scope still on when you came outside after the shooting? I didn't really notice. I was in shock. I wasn't really paying attention to any of that. I was just so worried about getting that stuff off my face and off my, off my hair. Um, I didn't pay attention to that. So backing up a little bit, do you know approximately what time of day it was when this attack occurred? It was around 3 o'clock, maybe 3.30. And you said that it took you a little bit of time to clear your lungs and the, the stinging to stop? Yeah, I, um, my lungs were stinging for quite a while, and my skin was stinging for quite a while, too. I, I, uh, I washed myself really good. I washed my hands. I washed my face. I washed my hair. I put on a clean T-shirt. And it probably lingered on my body for about an hour. I noticed it was still stinging, and um, and my lungs cleared out pretty quickly because I coughed coughed it out um, probably 40 minutes, and then my lungs felt normal again. And when you started to feel better, what did you do at that point? I went over to my truck, and um, well, I did a couple things. I put the gun back on back. I put it by the porch on the front the front front porch there where they could see it. I went to my truck. Right when I got to my truck, I saw a motorcycle going down the road, so I ran over to the edge of the property by the gate, and I was waving, trying to wave this guy down, whoever was on that motorcycle. And obviously he didn't see me, he didn't come, he didn't pull in. He was a good quarter mile away, but I thought that since it's so remote, he would see me, one person flagging their hands back and forth. And then when he didn't come see me, I went back to my truck. I got in my truck and I drove to an area that's about four miles away where you can get cell phone service. Um, I one time, once, Guillermo showed me one time with his four-wheeler, we drove up there so he could call his father. Um, so I knew where the cell phone service worked from, from that trip we made. So to be clear, was your cell phone working at the ranch? No, no cell phone works at the ranch. When you were seeking cell phone service, why? Because I wanted to call 911. And as you're driving out there to get cell phone service, what happens? I'm driving along. I'm looking at my phone to see if I'm getting any bars. I drove all the way up to an area called Camazon Peak. There's like an interest, interest sign there that the BLM put up. It talks about the, all the volcanoes and how they were created. And as I pulled up, there was a man over there reading the sign. And I pulled up and wanted to converse with him. I wasn't sure if he was friends with Guillermo or who he was. So I started a conversation with him. And you said you weren't sure if he was friends with Guillermo. Why were you concerned about that? I was just concerned. I wanted somebody to be a witness, and I wanted to have somebody with me uh, when I went back to the property. I was definitely in shock. I was kind of scared and in shock. My hands were still shaking. Um, I was definitely nervous. I was now kind of concerned about the police showing up with guns. I figured it'd be a good idea to have somebody out there with me. And so what did you do next? Um, we, we talked, and he said he had cell phone service. And um, 
he he asked me what my phone number was and what my name was. I gave it to him, and then he walked behind the back of my truck and was talking to 911. I thought he was giving him my license plate number, but I'm not sure if he did or not. And then right about the time he was on a conversation on the phone, I had three bars pop up on my phone, so I called 911 as well. I wanted to tell them as much as I could. I knew they'd have a hard time finding the place, so I wanted to tell them where it was. I got 911, I called, and I let them know what my name was, what my phone number was, and that what had occurred, and tried to give them directions to where I was at. After you spoke with 911, did you call anybody else? I called my dad. Why did you call your dad? Because I was just nervous and scared. Um, I knew when the police were gonna show up, there was gonna be guns out, and I didn't wanna get shot. Um, I was just, I just felt like I needed to have some people there with me because I was so scared and in shock. So what did you do next to try to ensure your safety? I took, I took David down to the ranch with me. Um, he followed me on his motorcycle. We took him down to the ranch. I wanted him to be witness of everything and to be there with me. Um, he uh, walked into the building. He took a look at what was going on and he exited the building. And instead of staying there with me, he jumped on his motorcycle and took off, which was kind of nerve wracking. I was hoping he would stay there with me. Um, so I, I climbed back in my truck and I sat in my truck for a good, for a long time. Um, I waited around for the police. It seemed like it took about two and a half hours before they arrived. It was daylight when, I, when the incident occurred. It was daylight when I met with David and when he went into the trailer to look at the scene. The scene. And, um, by the time, uh, it must have been around 6.30, 6.50 maybe, um, I decided I better drive back up to the, to the property. It seemed like two hours or, or more had gone by. So I ended up driving back up to the Camazon Peak Trail so I could uh, call 911 again or see what was going on. And uh, I jumped in my truck, I drove out of the property. I got maybe 100 yards out of the property and I saw three cop cars parked at the top of this road. It was an entrance road to the property. They were about a quarter of a mile away from the property. They had parked there and they weren't sure what to do, I think. So, so when you started to leave the ranch, did you know they were down there? I didn't. I thought, that, I thought they'd be up at Camazon or they just hadn't arrived yet. Are there any other roads that, lead, that go away from that ranch or is that the No, only it's road? a one way. Okay. So when you see the officers, what do you do? When I see the officers, I put my truck in park. I roll down my window to see if they're yelling anything or telling me what to do. Um, and sure enough, they were. And I turned the engine off because my truck's a diesel. So it's hard to hear anybody. And as soon as I put my head out the window, I heard them say, get out of the truck, put your hands up and approach us. Um, walk toward us with your hands up. And so did you follow their orders? I did. I just walked up there with my hands above my head. I had about... I don't know, I was a good 100 yards away from them. So I walked up the road. I knew they were pointing guns at me, so I was definitely nerve wracking. So I just made sure I kept my hands up no matter what. And did you try to follow all of their orders? I did follow their orders, yeah. I could hear them and I was definitely concerned about them having guns, so I followed their direction perfectly. How were you feeling when you were walking towards the police? I was scared. Um, I was still in shock from the incident. My hands were still shaking. Um, I was nerve wracked. I was, I was devastated. I couldn't believe what had just happened and that I was involved with it. Do you recall ever being asked by any of the officers what your name was? I don't, I don't think they ever asked my name. I had given my name already to 911. So I figured they had it. Um, I heard the testimony of that officer. He claims he asked me my name, but the whole time I sat in the back of the truck, he sat over there in front of his vehicle. He never really came over to converse with me. I don't remember him ever asking my name. So what you're talking about now when you were sitting in the back of a truck, are you talking about your truck or a police a, officer? A police car. They had uh, Dodge Ram trucks uh, with, with uh, sirens and markings, the sheriff's department. Did you ever give any of the officers the wrong date of birth? I don't think so. I know my date of birth. That's not possible. Did you ever attempt to conceal your identity from the police? I didn't. I'm not sure where that came from. Did um, you ever attempt to hide or destroy evidence? No, not at all. I told them exactly where my shirt was and where my coats were. I let them know exactly why I put them there and where they were. 
Chair, may I have just a minute? Mr. Cummings, I want to back up just briefly to the rifle that was found wedged between the mattress and the box springs. Okay. Was that your rifle? Not at all. I didn't know that was there either. And the evening where you fell asleep and woke up to the smell of propane, how were you feeling when you woke up? I felt a little bit dizzy. Um, it was kind of nauseous. I guess I was kind of nauseous in my stomach and a little bit dizzy. Um, it smelled really bad. And the spray that emitted in the bedroom, well, actually, you know what? Do you know when the spray from that canister came out? I, do, I don't. I didn't know he had a canister until I went back in there to get soap. That's when I saw the canister, and then I got a little more concerned because I didn't know what kind of toxic a material could have been in the can. I, I was definitely thinking it was worse than mace because of my lungs, but um, I don't know. I was in shock. I was jumping to conclusions a little bit. Well, you testified that he was swinging with his right hand. Yeah. And something was in his hand. Did you know what it was in his hand? I didn't. I thought it, I didn't know what it was. If it was a knife or what it was, a uh, back of a pistol or something. I never really saw it. He was swinging it so fast, and I was trying to get away the whole time. Okay. And so the spray hurt your skin and your lungs. Did it affect your eyes at all? It didn't. Um, when I stepped out of the trailer, I noticed a plane flying over the ranch, and I could see it perfectly, so I was happy to know that my eyes weren't affected. Okay. Mr. Cummings, why did you shoot and kill Guillermo Ariola? I was fighting for my life. He was uh, out of his mind at the time. He was he had a, he had it in for me. You could tell when somebody tells you they're going to kill you and they have they're pounding at you for over three different times where you fall down. Um, even pushing past a, when I've had the gun up in my hands, held, holding it properly, he still advanced on me and tackled me. Um, I knew he was serious. I was fearing for my life the whole time. Thank you. Pass the witness. Good morning, Mr. Cummings. Good morning, ma'am. You know what? I think I want to talk first of all about your extreme skiing career. Okay. Thank you. I, I looked, you had some videos, you had some on YouTube that you made as part of your company, right? Uh huh. And it looked like on those videos that you're almost going straight down. I've done a lot of big first descents. That's crazy. And it's my life. It's definitely scary. There's no, there's no future in not having fear when you're in the mountains. What kind of individuals, um, well, that's, that's the best question. I'm just, I'm just trying to find out. I mean, that just, would you, would you say that people who do that um, are like, kind of like adrenaline junkies? Is that the kind of people who do that? No, it's uh, called mountaineering. It's, it's called mountaineering. Mountaineering is uh, the way you come, climb a mountain and the way oh, you descend. Mountaineering, Sorry, yeah. Mountaineering. Yeah, there's, there's hundreds of people that do what I do. They're sponsored by companies, and they go all over the world skiing big mountains <laughs> and make a living at it. But so do you actually, so heliskiing, you're in a helicopter, and does the helicopter, like, take you to the top of the, the peak? Exactly. And then you jump out? No, the helicopter, the helicopter lands, and then you step out. And then you ski down the mountain, and then you get picked up again by the helicopter and flies you up for another run. Oh, okay. So it's a multi, multiple run day of heli skiing. They do it in Canada. They do it in Europe. They do it in Alaska. Alaska is the premier spot for helicopter skiing because we have such amazing big mountains at low elevation. So you're, 
you're not breathing really hard because you're at low elevation, but the vertical gain is impressive. It would be like skiing off of Sandia Peak and, and coming all the way down to Tramway Boulevard. Right. Okay. And that's, that's one heli ski run. Wow, okay. But the ability level, um, I have advanced intermediate, advanced and expert skiers. There's runs like this that are just perfectly like 20 degrees for four miles. You don't have to be an extreme skier to ski that. You could come up to Alaska and go skiing and have a good time. But it is, it is dangerous though. Has yeah, the sport of skiing is dangerous, yeah. You can hit a tree or you can slide down a slope, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, because I, I was just looking at some of your videos and just marveling at how you could, I mean, to me it looked like it was straight down. I'm sure it wasn't completely straight, but it was pretty steep. You know, yeah. Your Honor, I didn't have a chance to interview him, so hold on, I would hold on, hold on. I'm going to approach the bench. Know. Approach the bench. <laughs> Do you say approach? Yes, approach the bench. Okay. We're going to take a we're going to take a 15 minute recess. All right. And all the courtrooms, I think, are full, so they could just... Out in the hall, too? Yeah, out in the hall, yeah. Hold on. Go ahead, Father. Oh, thank you. I'm like, where do we go out? Which, yeah, Maybe see this. Okay, I I I interrupted the state's questioning and that Miss Romos asked or stated that she did not have the time or the right to interview the defendant. Well the court finds the state does not have the right to interview the defendant. Hold on, hold on. The, the other right he has, he has counsel. Not only does he have the right to remain silent, he also has the right to counsel. He has counsel. So there's no right to interview the defendant. Ms. Romo. Your Honor, that was not, clearly I, it was in response to Ms. Moss objecting, and my point was that as before she interrupted, I was about to say, and I was in the middle of saying, I would ask for leeway because we didn't have an opportunity to do a pretrial interview with him. Well, you don't have that right, Ms. Romo. Well, I know, but <clears> that's why <throat> I was asking for la leeway. That's all. That's there's all no, I was there, asking for. There, there's no leeway in that. Okay, but you could, I, I understand I, that, Judge, well, and I respect your ruling, but for them to jump up and down and her to start laughing in front of the jury and yelling prosecutorial misconduct, that's not what I was doing. Hold, hold on, hold on, Ms. Romo. This court knows I wouldn't do that. Hold on, hold on, Ms. Romo. She didn't do that in front of the jury. She did it after I sent it out to well, the jury. she was laughing. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny the motion for, for mistrial. Take a break, and, uh, and, and we will come back in about 10 minutes. Mr. Cummings, you may step down, go to the table, visit with your clients, with your okay. lawyers.
Yes, why don't you come back here? Okay, anything before we, get, we continue? Your Honor, in light of the defense counsel's comments, I would ask for a, um, a limiting instruction, or not a limiting instruction, but instruction to the judge to remind, from the judge to the jury to remind that the jury has, that the state has the burden of proof and the defense has no obligation, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure which comment I made that is uh, offensive to no, Mr. Not Lobo. A <laughs> however, however, well, well, I objected well, to a ridiculous, inappropriate, unconstitutional question. I'm doing my job. I I'm following the law. I understand that, Your Honor, and that's why I'm trying to protect her client's rights to ask the judge to remind the jury that the state has the always has the burden of proof and the defendant has no obligation. And the comment, it wasn't a comment, I was referring to your motion for a mistrial. That's all I was doing. You maybe see the couple of things. Okay. First, with, with regard to the issue of Ms. Moss saying that there's prosecutorial misconduct, that was done outside the presence of the jury. The jury had already left. Okay. Secondly, if, if I give a curative instruction, it's also going to include the, 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 the following, that the, the, the defendant has a right to remain silent and the state has no right to interview a defendant for two reasons. One, he has a right to remain silent. Secondly, because he has counsel. If I give an instruction, or we can just leave it. I would just leave it at this point. We'll just leave it. Okay. All right. Bring in the jury, Lorena. <clears throat> I got one. Thank you. Be seated. Ms. Romo, we may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Mr. Cummings, before the break, um, well, let's, let's let's just move on a little. You know, I think we've heard all enough about your career. Does that require quite a bit of athleticism? It does, it, uh, it requires a lot of technique um, and athleticism. Would you consider yourself a, an athlete, a pretty good athlete? Hey, I'm a world-class skier. I've made my living as one of the top skiers in the world. Okay. <clears throat> you mentioned several times in your direct about your three beautiful children. When's the last time you saw your children? Objection. Your Honor, she... Oh.
ask a question now. Your Honor, may we approach? You talked about a conversation that you allegedly had with Mr. Guillermo Ariola about how he struck someone's car with a hammer. Yeah. Weren't you laughing during that conversation? I didn't find it funny. But you were laughing with him. No, I was not. Okay. Was he laughing? 
he wasn't laughing. He was serious about what he was talking about. He um, okay. showed us. He showed Thank us you. That. No, you've answered the question. Thank you. Do you know if Mr. Adiella had a diesel truck? Um, I'm not sure if it was gas or diesel. But he didn't. He didn't surprise you when he came out. I mean, yeah, yeah I didn't expect him to show up. Um, he hadn't showed up for a lot of weekends that I had stayed out there. Okay, but he didn't come in to startle you, did he? Yeah, I was surprised. I didn't expect him to show up. Okay, but he didn't startle you, did he? Um, yes or no? Did he startle me? He did me? startle me. I knew I had stuff in the house that um, I needed to get out of there, so I was startled because I didn't want to have my rifle in the house when he showed up. I didn't mean to do that. And this incident about that you supposedly had with him when you first met Mr. Ariola that he was drunk and falling off his horse. I never said falling off his horse. Almost falling? I didn't say that either. Well, okay, well, that's what I heard. He was uh, running alongside his horse. His horse was taking him for a little bit of a ride. Um, he just couldn't get back up on the horse because he was intoxicated. Okay. And that obviously didn't stop you from hanging out with him or trying to buy land from him, correct? I still wanted correct. the land. Yes I still no. wanted the land. Sir, could you please listen to my question? I did. And answer yes or no, unless I ask for an explanation, all right? Do you understand? I understand. But you do admit that you and uh, Mr. Audiola got along great, right? We did. We got along just we fine. drank together, yes? Yes. She's interrupting him. I've asked a question. And I would ask the court to instruct the witness to answer my question appropriately and not be non-responsive, as hold I just on, instructed on, him. Hold on, Congressman. She asked a question, just answer yes or no, but let him finish the answer, though. Okay. Go on. Continue. And Mr. Cummings, to be fair, you will have an opportunity if you need to explain something when your attorney redirects you, okay? Okay. All right. But you got along great with him in the beginning, isn't that true? I yes. had a yes. Yes, no? we got along just fine. Okay, thank you. You drank beer together, yes? No. You drank whiskey together, we yes? Drank, we drank whiskey together. You ate steaks with him at his house, yes? Um, not not with him. You never really stayed in that trailer, did you? I stayed in the trailer every time I went there, yes, I did. Do you recall when you voluntarily talked to a reporter? David Williams, do you remember talking to Mr. Williams? I do. Do you remember telling Mr. Williams Do you remember telling Mr. Williams that you never stayed there? I never told him that. You didn't. Okay. Your Honor, I would like to play a portion of an interview. It's been redacted to play only that portion. I'm going to object. I don't think that that was the testimony. He already said that he stayed there a couple nights. He just, we've, listened, we've listened to that audio recording, and he did say that he stayed there. So it's not proper impeachment. It's not, because what she's trying to impeach him, what he didn't say. Go to bench.
Continue. Continue. And do you remember telling that same reporter? Now you just testified that you saw when you stayed there one night, you smelled propane. I did smell propane, yes. Didn't you also tell the reporter that you, you, it was all neuro? Um, I was dizzy from it a little bit, I think. But you told the reporter that it was all neuro, correct? I'm not sure. Do you want to hear the, the jail call? Um, I don't think I need to. Hold on, counsel. Approach the bench. Okay, L ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I need for you to totally disregard the last question from the for, that was asked by the prosecutor, and that shall not enter in any way in any type of deliberation. Ms. Romo, you may continue. You, do you remember having that conversation with the reporter? Yeah, I remember having a conversation with a reporter. And do you remember? Were, were you aware or were you made aware at some point that that conversation was being recorded? I wasn't aware of it. Were you made aware of that prior to your testimony here today? That my conversation was recorded? Well, just disregard that last question. But you do recall the conversation, correct? Yeah, it's okay. been a while. It's been two and a half years, but yeah, mm -hmm. I do recall it. Do you remember telling the reporter that you couldn't even recall the night? No, I don't remember that. And in the, the call to the reporter, it sounds like you're saying that Mr. Adiola arrived and this altercation began right away. I'm not aware of that. I don't think I would have said that. Do you think if I played a portion of that conversation, it might help refresh your memory? No, I don't know. Your Honor, the proper way to refresh his memory is to play this outside of the presence of the jury and then let it see if it refreshes his memory or if you have a transcript, they can provide a transcript. You can't just broadcast it. I realize that, Your Honor. you have a transcript of it? No, I'm doing it the same way they've been doing it to save time. I'm not interested in rushing this. Okay. 
Let, let's stay outside the presence of the jury, okay? Let's take another, uh, like a five, ten minute break. All right, we'll call you back in. Counsel, how, how, long, how long is the entire conversation or that? You know? Your Honor, um, I, we do have a transcript. No, no, I mean, but, but, no, the reason I'm asking is if you don't play a snippet of it now and then we have to send them again, how, how long is the entire, we play the whole thing to him better now. In, instead of doing it in, in little pieces, why don't we just play? Well, I can show him the transcript and see if that helps refresh his memory before we play. What I asked Ms. Romo is whether or not the transcript was complete, and she told me she didn't know. So if the transcript isn't complete, she shouldn't use the transcript. It was provided by the reporter, Your Honor. That's all I know. If it's what I've seen, it's a very incomplete. It's not a transcript. It's more just notes. So just play the audio. Okay, all right, we'll just, just play the, the whole audio then. Pay, and Mr. Cummings, pay attention because they're going to be asking questions on it. Okay. <laughs> So um, this guy, I find this little ranch, and he's, he's willing to do a pretty good deal. And I was looking at like five properties. Okay. And so I brought the thing out, and I left it there for maybe two weeks, but I never stayed there except for a couple. I stayed there a couple nights. This is his house, or are you in the mobile home? Yeah. 
I started pulling the trigger. Okay. I just started pulling the trigger. I don't even know if I shot him. I shot the floor like five or six times, and all of a sudden he just fell face first. I go over the water fountain, I clean the shit off. But it, it like evaporated so fast, it didn't even matter. Whatever it was, was um, it evaporated so much, it felt like uh, it was super cold, you know? Right. And then I'm just, oh, shit, I'm involved with big time shit here. Holy shit, what do I do, you know? And I didn't have cell service, I drove four, three miles up the road, and this is crazy. The only person, I get up there and my phone's not getting the signal and there's this guy named Walt Wood, the guy from Breaking Bad, the doctor dude. And he's like, um, uh, can I help you? I'm like, can I can see his eyes, he's creeping. I'm like, maybe do you have a cell service? He's like, Yep. And I'm medically trained. Yeah. Like, well, could you make a call? Are you willing to come down and be a witness of what happened down here? follow-up question was going to be, you made it sound like that this happened right when you got there. You didn't mention that you were in the fifth wheel at first, before all this happened. And that's not what that recording says. So, so her segmentation with that recording, and that recording absolutely doesn't support what the prosecutor is asking. Then he can answer and she can redirect on it. Judge? I'll allow that question. Are we ready then? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead, I'll bring you the joint. Jerome, let me continue. So, Mr. Cummings, you testified that you weren't sure what was in Mr. Audiolo's hand. That's correct. Now, I'm confused. Was he striking you or was he not striking you? He was trying to. But he never struck you. I blocked him. Oh. Are you confused about whether you were sprayed or not? I'm not confused. Okay. And were you sprayed? Yes. And you washed your face and hands? I did. And when you washed your face and hands, did it make it feel better? It did not. I had to go get some soap, and uh, the soap made it feel better. Okay. But you never told anybody you were sprayed with mace, did you? Yeah, I did. I told uh, Tomlinson. You told David McCullough you were sprayed with poison. I don't recall that. Did you hear him testify? I did. You didn't know Mr. McCullough before this incident, did you? I didn't. Did you ever have any fights or disagreements with Mr. McCullough? No, not at all. You also told the deputies on scene that it was some kind of neurological agent. Do you recall that? I believe I referred to it as chemical. Chemical 
and neurological. Do you recall that? I don't recall that. You said you had the AR and the kitchen. Why? Because I had worked on the scope. Um, I adjusted the scope that night before I went to bed. I was going to go sight it in the next day after you work on the scope. You got to sight the rifle in. But you were going to shoot five shoot, shoot the first? Yeah, I was. With armor piercing rounds? I had other rounds too. I had both kinds. When you put that rifle up against the porch, there was still a round chamber, was there not? I don't think there was. I thought I cleared it. Was there a round already chambered when Mr. Adiola got there? No, I pulled it back when I got away from him in the bathroom. So Mr. Adiola arrived around 2 p.m., right? About that time, 2, 2.30, 2 o'clock-ish. And you said the fight ended around 3 or 3.30, is that correct? Yeah. So what was happening between 2 and 3 or 3.30? He was unloading his truck, and I just was at my fifth wheel RV. Um, I was just hanging out at my, my camper, and then he was in the house doing some stuff. Why are you hanging out in your fifth wheel? I thought you were staying at the house. Because my, I was in my trailer because I was giving him space to have his own place. Can you think of any reason why Mr. Adiolo would just attack you for no reason? I figured he just had a bad temper. You've never seen that bad temper before, though, had you? I heard it. He talked about his neighbors. He definitely told me some stuff about his neighbors where he had, what was definitely using. I'm not, there's no questions for you, sir. Okay. I would like you to get down, with the court's permission, and show me how you were holding the gun and what Mr. Adiola was doing. I'll be Mr. Adiola when you were able to chamber around. This is your question. Okay. Let me see what my attorneys think. I'll, I'll allow it. Now, describe how the struggle started. You grabbed the weapon, it was against the, the, the table or the wall? Yeah. I 
and you have the jacket over here and that way I can pull it on. Okay. Yeah. And what? And then where did you chamber it? How did you chamber it? Okay, so then I got the gun out of his hand. He's out of the bathroom entrance. I pulled this back. Is still coming at you? No, he stood back. Oh, he stood back a second. I'm going like this. I said, stop. Mm -hmm. And you're staring at me to be right. I'm not in the back hallway of the bedroom. Officer, hold on. Double check that. Fire on. Hold on, hold on, Mr. Tommy. Double check that. Fire on. Make sure nothing in there. So. Hold on. But it's clear. What's on the floor? It's the zip tie now. Oh, the zip tie. Okay, the safety zip tie. Okay, all right. Okay. I, I agree with that. Uh, do we have a stick or something they could use? Uh, I what is that? Okay, Can we hold on. You can come back to the witness stand. Thank you. So when, when Mr. Adiello shot, what happened to you? He fell right at my feet. Mm -hmm. And then? And then I walked out of the room and went outside and coughed out what was in my lungs. Yep. Right no, I didn't say you fell right when the shots went off into the floor. What? I did not um, say he fell on me when I when the first two shots went off. I didn't say he Those fell. Those shots on went into the floor. They didn't go into him. That's not what I said. Maybe my question is that. You were down. He's trying to get the weapon. Mm-hmm. He's leaning over you. Correct? Yep. And you shoot two times. Exactly. I shot in the floor. I didn't shoot. I think he pulled it against the trigger. I don't remember pulling the trigger at first. Okay. And then he fell? Yep. No, he didn't fall. I got up a little ways in more of a crab walk position, and I started pulling the trigger. That's why all those, shot, those shots went through the wall. So you were crab walking backwards, and he's not leaning over you anymore. I'm trying to get away from him. But he's not leaning over you anymore. Oh, yeah, he was. He's definitely trying to hit me in the head with that canister. Was he leaning over you? Was he just following you like this when you were crawling backwards? 
He was so aggressive, you couldn't believe it. Yeah, he is following me. He's trying to strike me in the head with his hand, his right hand. Okay. Yep. And you have an AR and twice already. Yep. And he's still coming at you. He's still swinging, yes. And you were able to block all this. You I, I, had his, I had his arm by his coat for a long time, and I was blocking everything he was throwing at me. He was using his right hand. I was blocking him with my left hand. He's advancing on me, yes. What? He was advancing on me. He was following me on crab walk. There was no room in that. There was no space in that room. That room was tight. I crossed crab walked a little bit backward. I ran out of space, and he was on top of me trying to hit me the whole time. And so then what happened? So then the gun went off. I think I got up to a little bit, maybe up to my knees. I started pulling the trigger, and all of a sudden he just uh, he fell up. I, I might have been... I don't recall. I was definitely doing too many things at one time. You're saying he was coming at you and trying to hit you? He was leaning over me, trying to hit me in the head, yes. I think the photo depicts it perfectly. It shows where he ended up. There's no question before you, sir. Okay. There was quite a bit of blood, was there not? Not at first. Not at first? Yeah, when I exited the room, I didn't see any blood on the ground. First shot, and you said he fell face down. That's right. But how could he fall face down if you were still right in front of him and you didn't crab walk him? He landed right at my feet. He landed right at your feet. Yes. And he had been shot in the head, in the temple, and the chest? I couldn't tell at the time. I didn't look. But there was no blood? I left the room as quick as he hit the ground. I was definitely. But when he was shot, you were right next to him. I was right in front of him. You were right in front of him. Mm-hmm. How is it that you didn't get any blood on you? I don't know. Did you get blood on you, your face, your hands? No, I didn't have any blood on me. Hmm. Interesting. Can I object to the editorial comments by the prosecutor? Okay, let's move on. When I came back in to get soap, I looked in there, there was blood. So you didn't get any on you or your hands or your clothes? Nothing. Right? Okay. Not that I know of. Well, you would have known, wouldn't you? I didn't. Uh, I took my clothes off, so they were on the back of my t truck, but I don't think any blood was on me. I believe so. That heater was not plugged in, sir, was it? I don't know. I never used it. You never used it. It was not plugged in, was it? I don't know. How do you explain if you if it got knocked over in the struggle, how do you explain that this is the best? How do you explain that it landed right there, straight up, instead of falling over? I don't know. It was Can you rephrase your question, please? How do you explain? Let me get a different picture. But before I, I'll just move on. Well, well she looks good in the picture. But let me ask, let me ask you a different question. That room very narrow, correct? Yeah, it was pretty small. I don't know. The clothes were behind the bed. The clothes were behind the bed. Mm -hmm. No, not all the clothes, were they? You sure? Yeah, there's the bed, there's the rubber maid, and there's the clothes. The mirror wasn't, was it? 
I don't recall him there. And how do you explain that nothing got knocked over in the kitchen when you fell against the cabinet? Yeah, all this struggle occurred in the hallway. There's nothing in the hallway. There's no cabinets. There's nothing, no shelves. I kind of slid off of it. It hit me in the top of my buttocks. You must have fell pretty hard. Did you? Um, I fell backward. It wasn't too hard. I caught myself with my arms. Which arm? The arm that you were holding? The I don't know which. I don't know which arms. Off? I don't know what, I didn't have the AR at first. I fell without holding onto the gun. So if you're an avid hunter, I assume that you know about gun safety. I sure do. Are you disputing the testimony of Carlos Herrera that there was a round chamber when you found that what when you found that weapon? And I could have sworn I cleared it. Okay. I want to get back to this the struggle a little bit in the timeline. Not very long, just uh, like a minute or two. A minute or two. It happened very quick. And you said about 3 or 3.30, do you think? That would be my guesstimation. I didn't have a watch on. Sure. But that, you know, that all happened pretty quickly, right? Yep. And then right afterwards, this is, a, this is someone you had been friendly with, right? Yeah, as best I could. I did. When I came in to get the soap, I checked. How did you check? I looked in the room, and there was a big pool of blood. He wasn't moving. His chest wasn't rising. I'm medically trained, so it was obvious he, did, he wasn't uh, breathing. Right after you shot him, you didn't check then to see if he was okay? I did. I looked in there. I went, right after you shot him? Oh, not at all. I left the room as quick as I could. I was uh, in shock at the time and was... was uh, Gasping for air, my lungs were full of something not good. Because you think he sprayed you with poison? I didn't know what he had. But that's what you told me to recall. I don't know, I don't recall that. started coming at you, and you fell, and you grabbed that AR, did you fall into the bathroom? I fell into the I hallway. Did object to the reference to it being an AR? I think it's been clearly established it's actually not an AR. It's a shoot rifle. It's, okay. it's not. <laughs> it's a 6556. No, it's not. I did. I wasn't in the bathroom. I was just in the doorway of the bathroom. What is the bathroom directly across from in that home? Nothing. It's just a wall. What is it directly across from? Uh, the hall. The wall in the hall. You sure about that? Yeah. It's not directly across the front door? It's not. It's a little off-centered. If I open that front door, I can look directly into that bathroom, can I not? It's not directly, but you can see into the bathroom. They're off-centered. They're off You're within inches of the front door, is that correct? When I was in the doorway of the bathroom, I wouldn't say inches. At some point, after you grab the weapon, and you fall, you fall and you grab the weapon, at that point, you're, you're falling back, you were within inches of that front door. How many 
Counsel, no, I fell into the back. Approach the bench, Counsel. So you were within inches of that door at some point when you were crab crawling, crawling backwards, correct? Yeah, I'm pretty sure the door was shut and I was more in the back room. Yes I was. No, were you within inches of the front door? I wasn't within inches of the front door, no. At no time? It passed by me on my left when I was getting away from him. I don't think I spent that much time um, somewhere of the times off. It must have happened a little bit later in the day than I thought. I didn't have a watch on me. I wasn't paying attention to the time. So what's the first thing you did after you saw Mr. Ariola dead in the bedroom? What's the next thing, the very next thing you did? I went out to the... Imagine, I said, this has been asked and answered repeatedly. It's really getting repetitive. 
Not in this form. I went out uh, and washed myself up better with soap. Okay. Well, no, you washed and then came back and got the soap, right? I'd never looked in on, El El on uh, Mr. Ariola until I came back to get soap. I looked into the room and I saw the blood. I saw no, no breathing from his chest, from his back. And then I went into the kitchen. I got a little bit of soap and filled my palm with soap. I went back outside where the water was and washed myself off more. And then what? And how long did that take? I don't know. Not very long. What did you do right after that? I went to my truck to change my shirt. Mm -hmm. And what else? My truck was about, I don't know, 100 feet away. Okay. Uh, then I went to the edge of the property when I saw a motorcycle, and I tried waving down Mr. McCullough. Mm -hmm. I was waving my hands like this as he rode by. But you didn't get in your truck. When he didn't respond... What did you do? I got in my truck and drove that way to try to catch him okay. and to use the phone up where the phone service worked. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you were explaining on direct that the reason you didn't tell Mr. McCullough right away, well, you didn't tell Mr. McCullough right away, did you? I didn't. I um, asked... I talked to him a little bit. I wasn't sure if he was friends with Mr. Ayola or not. my phone too at the time what do you mean you're using your phone i was trying to get service i was looking for bars on my phone While you're talking to Mr. exactly okay. once again but you did not tell him right away that you had shot a man in self-defense and you needed help um i i told him pretty quickly after you talked about motorcycles i don't recall talking about motorcycles second thoughts and came back? You don't remember that? I thought I talked to him the first time I arrived. And you told him that the eight the weapon that you shot the man with, the man, was in the back of your truck under, the, under your clothes that you were wearing. I don't recall that. And after Mr. McCullough called 911. No, he called 911 directly. He was uh, behind my truck calling 911. And then I got three bars. Sir, I haven't asked a question yet. Please. After Mr. McCullough called 911 and he was on the phone with 911, you were standing there talking to him, talking. I was sitting in my truck. I wasn't standing there. But would you agree that you were close enough that you could be heard on dispatch? He was behind my truck. I couldn't see him. Did you hear yourself on dispatch? Yeah. Okay. Who are you talking to? I didn't hear myself on dispatch. I only heard David McCullough on dispatch. So you said you had three bars now. Who are you calling? I called 911. At the same time as David McCullough? Yes. I wasn't sure he was on the phone with 911. He was behind my truck, like 10 feet behind my truck. My truck's really big. It's like 27 feet long. Did you hear Mr. McCullough on that call try to answer a dispatch question about where the, where, whether you still had the weapon or whether, what would happen? And they, he, Mr. McCullough, in fact, talked to you to get no. information to relay to the dispatcher. I don't recall what he said. And you didn't call 911, even though you say you had cell phone service right there at the same time as David McCullough. As soon as I got service, I called 911. You didn't call, even though you just testified that you already 
had three bars. You didn't call 911 until about 13 minutes after you knew Mr. McCullough called 911. No, that's, that's, that's not correct. Do you have any reason? I called 911. I don't know if they got together on the time of the call, but I called 911 while Mr. McCullough was calling 911. I ended up getting hold of BHI, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and uh, he ended up getting hold of Sandoval County Sheriff's Department. What do you mean got together on the time? The time, um, I called as soon as I, had, I talked to Mr. McCullough out my window of my truck. I told him what happened. I asked him if he had bars on his phone. He said he did. Can you please call 911 and let them know what happened out here? And about the same time as he walked to the back of my truck, my phone got three bars on it. I dialed 911 immediately and told them my name, my phone number, and where I was at. Right. Why did you call your dad before you called 911? Because I wanted someone to be out there with me. I was worried about the police arriving with guns. I wanted to have some people with me. Because police with guns isn't exactly the safest thing you, you could deal with in life. Fair enough. Are you testifying that you, did, you weren't sure what the defendant had in his hand? Yeah, that's what I, I didn't know what he had in his hand. Did you know that Mr. Carrier Mace? Yeah, when we drank that night, he told me he had sprayed his neighbors with mace. So you knew he carried mace? I didn't know he carried it. I knew he had used it prior. If that's what they found, yes. Yeah, I wanted to make sure I had a witness of that. Mm -hmm. You made sure of that, right? I don't know. I just told told David McCullough. Yeah, I think you're right. I wanted them to know that he had a weapon, that he had something in his hand he was trying to hit me with. But you never told him that. You never told David McCullough that. I think I told McCullough that. No, you did not tell Deputy. Well, we'll, we'll just let the, this testimony stand for itself. Did you ever tell the deputy that you had something in your hand? I think I did.
I never, I never said I, I, that's a misstatement of the testimony. I'm paraphrasing. It's, Could you see? All right. It's an incorrect paraphrase. All right. Were your eyes burning? No. They weren't? Just the side of my face was burning. The side of your face was burning. Okay. Because of something he sprayed out of that canister. That was my guess, yes. Well, did he have anything else in his hand to spray? I didn't see anything else. I asked him to go, yes. And you used those words, witness the body. I can't recall that. And after you got out there, you made sure that he saw the canister in the hand, correct? I don't recall that either. I just told him to go take a look. And then when it was obvious there was no help available for Mr. Ayola, you were still there with Mr. McCullough, David McCullough, right? He left. But you were there at first, right? Yeah, I was on the property. Were, did you go in the house with him? I wasn't sure about that. McCullough testified that I did, but I don't recall. I thought I stayed outside, but it's hard to remember everything. And mind you, I was devastated and definitely in shock. If that's what you call it, I'm not sure exactly what that means. But Mr. McCullough said he was going to go out to the point by Cabazon Peak so he could direct the deputies in because the place is hard to find, right? That's right. And you said, I'll be right behind you, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I I know I drove back toward that direction to go meet the police, but that's when I ran I ran into them. The deputies didn't get there till almost an hour to the ranch. Is that right? Oh, it took more than that. I was there a long time. And you were just leaving your property when the deputies are arriving on scene. I'm going to object. That's a misstatement of the testimony. It, it wasn't his property. Oh. I, I believe I said the property. When the police didn't arrive, I started driving out to go back to Cabazon, but I ran into the police about a quarter of a mile away from the property with their lights on. That's when I stopped my truck and turned off the engine so I could hear them. Did you know any of these deputies before? No. So do you know any reason why they would make up or lie about what you did or didn't do or said or didn't say? I never called anybody a liar. But you would agree that your testimony is different than what they testified to? Um, I don't believe they, re they reconstructed the site, the, the scene. Um, I think I have a little better account of everything since I was the only witness. All right, that's not what I asked you, sir. Go ahead and ask me again, please. I'll move on. I think I've made the point. When you talk to the deputies on scene and David McCullough, you never told them that you were screaming for him to stop. I wasn't screaming. I was waving my arms. Oh. He was too far away for voice voice to work. He was a he was literally a quarter mile away when he rode by on his motorcycle. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That was my fault. I'm back at the scene now. I'm going to struggle with Mr. Aguilar. And I think, I think, you testified earlier that you were
were screaming at him to stop as he was coming towards you. I did yell stop. Okay. But you, my question to you is, you never said that, even though you were claiming self-defense, self-defense, self-defense. You admit that you said that to the deputies, right? I think so. Yeah. And, but you never said, I told him to stop, and he never stopped. You didn't say anything like that, did you? I was trying not to make any statements until I had an attorney. Mm -hmm. So the answer is no. When you were telling them other things voluntarily, you never told them that. Told him what? That he screamed, or you screamed for him to stop. I gave very brief statements. Is that a no? I don't recall. I sat in my truck. Why didn't you follow Mr. McCullough when he said, I'll be right behind you? I don't recall that. And isn't that when you took the rifle out of the back of your truck and put it, propped it up against the porch during that time? I don't, I don't recall when I did the rifle. Uh, mind you, I was definitely in shock. I don't recall everything that happened. I definitely had more concerns about the police officers arriving with, right, with rifles and guns. I was definitely concerned about that. Well, in fact, and that's one of the conversations, the first kind of three-way conversation that Mr. McCullough had with dispatch while you were there. We're saying, I was, don't touch the weapon, right? I was where? You were standing right next to him, or sitting in your truck right next you were close enough that you could have a conversation. When did we have a conversation? When you were on, when McCall, David McCullough was on the phone with dispatch. He was behind my truck. We weren't uh, in communication you at that point. You were having a conversation? I had a conversation before he dialed 911. So that voice where he was talking <coughs> to dispatch and then talking to you, that's not you? I called the Bureau of Indian Affairs. My, my phone rang to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. His phone rang through to Sandoval County. So are you going to answer my question, sir? Rephrase it, please. Maybe I'm misunderstanding you. Mr. McCullough was on the phone with 911 and listened to the four times because the call got dropped three times. At one point, the dispatch asking where the gun is. And Mr. McCullough is getting information from you at the same time he's talking to dispatch. Do you not recall hearing your own voice? On the he wasn't talking to me. He was behind my truck looking at my license plate when he was calling 911. And then I got on the phone. I couldn't have had a conversation because I was busy on the phone talking to 911. 13 minutes later. I don't know. I, I think it was right away. You never told anyone that you encountered that day that you were hit by a can of mace or that he was attempting to hit you with He had glancing blows for sure. I felt it, I felt something up. Sir, sir what? please listen to my question. Okay. You never told anyone that you encountered, not David McCullough, not the deputies on scene, not the reporter, that you were hit with a, that you were he was trying to strike you with a can of mace. You never said that, did you? I never said it when. When you talked to David McCullough, when you talked to the deputies, when you talked to David Williams. Um, I can't recall. Do 
You never told anyone about one of you hitting that heater. I don't recall. You never told anyone that your skin was steaming. I did. I, th I told the police officers. No, I did not. He sprayed you with it. You shot him and he fell down. Is that right? Yeah, he fell right at my feet. Uh -huh. Then how would you have the catamaran that he just sprayed at you pointing at himself when he fell, when he was shot? I'm going to object to this question. I think that that is a question that should have been uh, posited to the medical investigator, the uh -huh. forensic pathologist, and not to a lay witness who has no experience with forensics. So you don't know? Please repeat I, your question. I objected to that question. Well, you started with four, yeah? Other than calling 911 and putting the, the rifle weapon up against the court, did you do anything else to document that it was self-defense? Your Honor, may we approach? Be safe to say, sir, that your memory of what happened that day was clear then or now? Um, I don't know. Um, it's been two and a half years, so I've been trying to play this back in my head every day since it, ha since it happened. Um, I would say I'd have a better, bigger picture of it now after working with my attorneys and uh, knowing more about the canister and everything else. That's a restroom. It looks like a door. The door into the mudroom. I said that, yes. That's the that's the door into the mud room. Which is the door that leads to the outside, correct? There's another door. And then it leads to the outside. Correct? Yeah, you go through a, the main door and then you go through a screen door to get outside. About three feet? Three feet. No, it's about six to eight feet. It's a pretty good sized little porch. I told you it was 10 feet by 8 
Um, yeah, probably, prob probably so. Probably twelve by eight. And you were struggling there. Excuse me. You guys were both struggling for the record. Yeah, exactly. I just have a few questions for you, Mr. Cummings. Okay. On cross-examination, you, Ms. Romo asked you several times if you were startled by Mr. Ariola's arrival at the property that day. Yeah, I remember her asking that. Yeah, and you said that you didn't mean to do that. You didn't mean to have the rifle in the house when he showed up. Yeah, that's right, I wasn't expecting him. So what do, what do you mean, though? Why were you concerned about the rifle being in the house with him? It just wasn't appropriate. I didn't think I should have it in, in there when someone else showed up. Kind of hunter safety. It should have been put away, but I didn't expect him to show up so quickly. Okay, so this is just a gun safety concern. Yes. And Ms. Romo had you get down on the ground and basically show how you were crawling and retreating away from Mr. Ariola. Do you remember that? I do. Demonstration and Ms. Romo was standing over you and swinging her hand at you. Yep. How many times did you go down on the ground because of Mr. Ariola shoving you? Uh, three times. And after the first time he shoved you to the ground, did you shoot him? After with the, repeat that, please. After the first time he attacked you and shoved you to the ground, did you shoot him? No, not at all. I, After the second time that he attacked you and shoved you to the ground, did you shoot him? No. After the third time that he shoved you and tackled you to the ground, did you shoot him then? I did. And was it an immediate thing or did you still retreat and fight? I was still retreating and fighting, trying to block him. And when you were retreating in that back bedroom away from Mr. Ariola, you said he still had that canister and he was still swinging his right hand? He did. He had and, something in his hand. And what was he doing with his left hand? And grabbing the rifle. And when you said, that, and you were demonstrating how he was grabbing it, he was grabbing at the scope? Yeah, the top of it. Okay. Is that when the scope cap was ripped off? That must have been when it came off. Okay. And as you, after the scope cap comes off, you are still trying to retreat away from him, is that correct? I'm out of room at this point, so I'm fighting to get to my feet. Okay, and what is he doing? He's swinging with his right hand, swinging, trying to hit me in the side of the head. And what's and he doing with his left hand? He's trying to pull the gun out of my hand. Just a clarification. Did you call 911 first or your father first? I think I called 911 first. Okay. And when you spoke to Mr. McCullough that day, did you give him a full play-by-play -play description of everything that had happened? I didn't. I didn't feel it was appropriate. What? What did you think was appropriate to tell him? I told him that some guy attacked me and that I shot him. And why did you tell him that? So he would know what happened, so he could help me and be a witness to it. And you wanted him to call 911, right? I sure did. Now, 
No further questions. Let's take our lunch break now and uh, be back about uh, 10 after 1. We'll start at 1.15. All right. Back about 10 after 1, we'll start at one fifteen.
The jury is present. Anything before we get started, Council? I no. think I'm mistaken. No, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Uh, bring in the jury, Loretta. Maybe see that. So more she may call our next witness. The defense will call Debbie Dominguez. Okay. Ma'am, go ahead and state your full name for the record. Debbie Dominguez. And Ms. Dominguez, did you know Guillermo Ariola? Yes, I did. And how did you know him? I was raised and grew up with the whole family. Uh, we lived right next door to each other. Okay. Uh, so he was your neighbor? Yes, he was our neighbor. Um, thank you. I'm just going to ask you some very pointed questions, okay? Okay. Did you ever witness Guillermo Ariola spray anyone with mace? Yes. And who was it that he sprayed? He sprayed my son, Alonzo Dominguez. He sprayed my cousin, Joe Chavez, and he sprayed me, but I turned my face and he didn't get me. So he tried to spray you Yes, also. he did. Now let me ask, <clears throat> the mace that he used, uh, did it have any dye in it that you were aware of? No, none at all. Um, <clears throat> Now, when he tried to spray you and you turned your head, um, had you physically threatened him at all? No. Did Mr. Chavez physically threaten him? No. Did your son physically threaten him? No. Did you know Mr. Ariola to possess guns? Yes. Uh, and let me, let me back up. The, uh, the incident that involved the mace if you know, was Mr. Ariola intoxicated at the time? You could smell the liquor off of him. Okay. Ma'am, do you know Dean Cummings? No. You've never met this man here? No. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Yeah, may we approach before I start Amen. Hey,
Good afternoon, Ms. Dominguez. Good afternoon. I'm going to ask you some questions about what you just testified to, okay? Um, you said that you've known Mr. Adiola pretty much your whole life, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, um, I you grew up to together, right? Yes, but I moved away for 22 years and came back. He was already older. He was a younger kid when I moved away. Okay, so let's talk about this incident that you testified to. Do you remember doing a pretrial interview with me on the telephone? Do I remember? Yes, do you remember doing an interview? Was it you? I, do you remember doing an interview no. <laughs> on the telephone? No. You don't remember doing an interview on the telephone? Okay. Um, do you have memory problems? No. No, but you don't remember talking about this case on the telephone? I remember an uh, investigator calling me and asking me if I knew Ariola, um, if I knew um, the case about. Um, okay, well, do you remember on, the, on July 11th of this year, on the telephone, you spoke with me, and I believe um, the investigator was also on the phone, and potentially an attorney. And what is your name again? My name is Jonna Walker. Do you remember doing a telephone interview? I remember doing a telephone in, in, uh, interview at 1 o'clock or something like that. Okay, so now you remember that interview. Yes, I do. Okay. So do you remember in your interview you told me over and over that you couldn't even remember when this had happened? You couldn't give me a date? I couldn't give, I can't give you dates on it. Okay. I just know it was like five years ago. Okay. I don't know dates on all the stuff that went on. Okay, but you remember the incident? Yes, I do. Okay, and this was July 9th, 2017? Does that sound right? About. Okay. And um, do you remember telling me that this was a verbal argument only before the mace came out? Yes. Okay. You told me that they had a little bit of a fight. They were pushing each other like chest to chest, like that kind of a argument, okay. a verbal like Who's going they? in front of each other. Was they your brother, Joe? No. It was... Um, my son, it was, it was my son, Joe, my cousin, like he was right at us, him and his cousin, I guess, that lived right next door, okay. would come up and they'd bump each, they would bump against each other's chests. Okay, and that's Mr. Adiola's, what you called him, his little cousin, is that right? The one that lived next door. I didn't never know who he was. Okay, but you referred to him as his little cousin? I think as his cousin. Okay, so it was Mr. Adiola and his little cousin. Right. And they were arguing with Joe... Joe was to the side, my son here, and I was to the side here. Okay. And you said that they were all pushing each other. Like going in, in you know, when they're yelling at each other and uh, verbally, and they're like right in each other's faces. So chest bumping and shoving, would mm -hmm. that be accurate? Yes. Okay. And you told me that this was a rumble. Do you remember that? Well, it was like a rumble. They were like on tor towards back and forth on each other. Okay. And um, you were out there with them in this rumble? Yes, I was. Okay. So it was... Your son, your brother, and you fighting Mr. Adiola and his little cousin in the rumble, right? Yeah. Okay. But your husband, Mario, was also there, right? My husband was there at the beginning, and he took off. He said, I don't want to get involved in this. He took off. Okay. So then it was four against two. Yeah. And then Tanya was calling the cops. Okay. So then three men, your husband, your son, and Joe. My husband didn't even get near him. My husband okay, was But he was there, right? Yes, Plus he was. Plus you. Sorry. Plus you, so that's four people against two, right? And you never told the police that your husband Mario was there. Is that correct? Yeah, because he wasn't there when he took off. Okay, and you never told police that Tanya, Joseph's wife, was also there, right? She was up in the in the yard calling the cops. Okay, so, so she was she there in the rumble? I don't recall her being there. She was up further up calling the cops. Okay. If she was there, would that be five people against two? Yes. Okay. And then you said your son was maced and your brother, Joseph? No, my cousin, Joseph. Cousin. Gotcha. Cousin Joseph was mm -hmm. maced. But I know him by Joe. Okay. And then Joe went into the house and retrieved a pellet gun. Is that right? I don't recall a pellet gun. Okay. And he shot it in the air? Do you remember that? I don't even remember that. I just remember I was holding my son down because I'm like, don't touch him. Come on, he's drinking and he, that's what he wants, you know, because it's like scary when... Okay, so he didn't shoot 
I don't recall at seeing Mr. Audiola with no, the pellet gun. I don't recall that at all. So, and then Mr. O Mr. Audiola shot the mace, right? Yes. To, and did it break up the rumble? Um, pretty much, because then the cops started coming. Okay. Where is your son or Joseph transported to the hospital for this? No, just the ambulance came and they went in and they um, washed out their eyes. Okay. And this was just a verbal argument where you guys right. were saying Shoving. stuff back and forth? Mm-hmm. Okay, and you yourself was saying stuff back to Mr. Audiola, yes, correct? Yes, because he tells you some ugly things. Okay, so you said that he was carrying mace. Where does where does he typically carry the mace? Does he have it in a certain pocket all the time, or? I have no idea. He just pulled it out, and I don't even, I didn't see him. Have you ever seen him carry mace before? No. Okay. This is the first time. No further questions, Your Honor. Now, when I use the word fighting, the way that I define that is two people are physically hitting each other. Right. So let me ask you this. Were you fighting with Mr. Ariola? No. Was Joe Chavez fighting with Mr. Ariola? No. Was your son fighting with Mr. Ariola? No, they were just chest to chest. Just kind of in each other's faces? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Just for this lady? Yes. Um, <clears throat> when this occurred, were you on your own property? Yes. When he came around, we were on my mom's property, yes. Did you invite him into the property? No. Did you invite his cousin onto the property? No. Did you have a weapon? No. Did your son have a weapon? No. Did Mr. Chavez have a weapon? No. Did Mr. Ariola's cousin have a weapon? Yes, he did. No further questions. Thank you, Ms. Dominguez and Mr. Diamond. You Thank you. Step on the way down. Defense, you may call your next witness. The defense will call Joe Chavez. Chavez, come up here and watch your step. We're going to be standing here so you're legal right now, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give the truth on the penalty of law? Yes. Go ahead, take a seat, and then uh, when you speak, get it up close to the mic and speak out loud, okay? Okay. Go ahead and state your full name, sir. Joseph A. Chavez. And Mr. Chavez, move that microphone a little closer to you. Okay. Mr. Chavez, did you know Guillermo Ariola? Yes. How did you know him? We kind of grew up together. And as adults, were you still in contact? No. Well, other than me being his, being his neighbor. Yeah, okay, and I, j just to be clear, you said you were his neighbor? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Did you ever uh, have an occasion uh, where Mr. Ariola sprayed you with mace? Yes. And did the mace have any kind of dye in it? No. It didn't dye your skin or your hair or, well, 
pardon me, uh, or, or your clothing in any way? No. Um, at the time that Mr. Ariola sprayed you with mace, were you physically threatening him? No, we were just like in an argument. Did you have a weapon? No, not at that point in time, no. Not at that point in time? No. Okay. Uh, at the time that Mr. Ariola sprayed you with mace, do you know whether or not he was intoxicated? Yes. And w was he intoxicated? Yes. And how could you tell? The only time he was really aggressive was when he was intoxicated, which was pretty much daily. Prior to being sprayed with the mace, had you hit Mr. Ariola? No. Had you threatened to hit Mr. Ariola? No. Had you gone on to Ms. Ario Mr. Ariola's property? No. Where did this incident take place? It took place on El Callejon, which is a um, it's the road in front of my, my home. The road in front of your home? Yes. Do you know Mr. Cummings? No. You've never met him before? No. I'll pass the witness. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions now, okay? Okay. Um, you've known Mr. Ariola. You said you were best friends since you were kids, right? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this mace incident. Do you remember when it happened? Oh, it's been a while. I mean, maybe three years. Would it surprise you that it was five years ago? More than five years ago? Well, the frequency of incidents, I mean, yeah. So would, you, would it surprise you that it was July 9th, 2017? Okay. Okay. Do you remember telling law enforcement that you were walking with your nephew up the roadway? Yes. Okay. And this is the Al Cajon Road, is that correct? Yes. And then you told law enforcement that Mr. Adiola started to taunt you and talk to you. He was, yes, I was in my driveway when they were coming down the uh, El Cajon. Okay. So, Mr. Chavez, this was a verbal argument, is that right? Yes. And then Mr. Adiola pulled a can of mace out of his pocket and maced you and your nephew. He was going to mace my wife, and I lunged in front of her because I wasn't sure what he had in his hand at the time. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, you never told the police that your wife Tanya was there, is that right? Well, they questioned her. She was there. Law enforcement never documented that your wife, Tanya, was present. So let's talk about who was there. Okay. You were there, and I your nephew there. was there, right? It was, it's a cousin that was there. Okay. A cousin, not yes. your nephew. Right. Okay. And Mr. Adiola was there? Who else was there? Um, his nephew. Okay. And... After Mr. Ariola pulled out the can of mace, you then went inside your house, correct? Correct. And you got a pellet gun, correct? Correct. And you shot at Mr. Ariola, correct? Correct. Okay. And you were not even involved in the initial verbal argument, is that correct? That is correct. But you decided that you wanted to go down and see what was happening at the end of the road and join in. No, I right? did not go down. You didn't go join in? No, the argument and the scuffle came to me. I was in my driveway. Okay. Um, but this was just a verbal argument at that point? Yes. That you decided to join in? Uh, no, I didn't decide to join in. I just decided to go out there to try to kind of, you know. And then your wife, Tanya, also did, decided to join in, right? Yes. Okay. And you jumped in front of Tanya, so she wouldn't get maced, but you got maced. Correct. 
Was there pushing and shoving in this rumble? Yeah, there was a little bit of pushing. Were you pushing? Uh, no, I wasn't. Okay, you were just being pushed? Yes. Okay, was Debbie pushing? No. No? But this was just words and pushing and shoving, right? Correct. Was Mario there? I believe he was in the background. It all happened pretty fast and quick, I mean. So it's you, your wife, Tanya, right? Two people. Debbie, her husband, Mario, so that's four people. Her son. And her son, so five people, against Mr. Audiola and his cousin, you said? His nephew. Nephew. So it was five against two. Would that Correct. sound accurate? Yes. Okay. And no one was ever arrested for this incident, right? Correct. There were no charges? Correct. And you were a willing participant in this rumble? Um, what do you mean by willing? You could have not joined in the rumble and the pushing and shoving, right? You could have just watched them. Uh, Your Honor, I'll object. He's indicated that he wasn't pushing anyone. Sustained. Did you join in the verbal argument? Yes. So you willingly joined into the verbal argument? Yes, this was this would happen daily. Okay. Was this the only time you ever saw Mr. Adiola use mace? No. Just a moment, sir. You were never afraid of Mr. Adiola, correct? Yeah, I was. Do you remember talking to me on the telephone, doing a telephone interview? Yes. That was July, in July, back in July, we talked about this case. Do you remember that, sir? Yes. Do you remember during that interview you told me you've known him so long that you never were afraid of him? I was more afraid for my family. I mean, do you remember telling me that you've known Mr. Adiola so long that you're not afraid of him? Yeah, I just I mean, okay. he, I mean, no further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Let me ask, did you and your family members gang up on Mr. Ariola and his nephew? No. His nephew, I mean, the reason why I went out there was because his nephew had a, uh, a large knife on the side. Hold on. Well, I, th I think he gets to explain it, and I think that the state has clearly opened the door. Overruled. Go, Go ahead. ahead, sir. I mean, I went out there to kind of, you know, stop what was gonna, probably going to take place. I mean, well, wait a minute. I, I Hang, on. In it. Hang on. Let me back you up. Okay. You said the reason you went out there was because Mr. Ariola's nephew had what? He had a large knife in a sheath um, on his side. And what, why was that concerning to you? Because, um, I mean, he, at that point, he, you know, I believe he was, he was dangerous. You believe he I mean, was dangerous? Yes, because, you know, the alter altercation, altercation came to me. They were obviously arguing and coming down the road. So this started somewhere else. But he didn't, you know, he went out and actually was the aggressor. Who was the aggressor? Mr. Ariola. Okay. 
Uh, and you, you were asked by the prosecution if you ever saw Mr. Ariola use mace an, a, di a different time, right? Yes. A and did you? Yes. What was that time? I've got a surveillance. Objection, Your Honor. Can we approach? She asked. Overruled. Go ahead, sir. She's got a surveillance. I have a surveillance camera footage of him macing my dog. And did you ever have any interactions with Mr. Ariola where you were frightened of him? There was a few, yes. There were several occasions where he would. Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. All right, I'll, I, I, I don't have any further questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chavez, you excuse me. Be careful on the way down. Okay. Then we'll follow okay. I'm just going to see if our uh, next witness is in the hallway. All right. Your Honor, our next witness had a doctor's appointment, and I did speak with him on the phone. He said that he was on his way. He's not here yet. Uh, we can begin with Mr. Brudenell, or we can wait a few moments for Mr. Klinger. Let's take a break, and once you have either one of them here, let me know, and we'll get started. Let's take a break. Lord, let's check see if the middle courtroom is available. We're going to take them out to the hallway, and I'll, I'll check for you. I'll let you know. Okay. We'll take a, a brief All break. right. Uh, let me know when your witness is here. We'll get started, okay? Thank
Did we get the jury lawyer? How are you? I'm not okay. How are you? Good, thank you. May be seated. Please You swear or affirm your testimony, you are about to give the truth on the penalty of law. I do. Go ahead and take a seat and get closer to the microphone and speak up loudly. Sir, can you go ahead and state your full name for the record? Sure. My full name is Carl David Klingler. And how do you spell your first name? Carl with a K. K-A-R-L. And how did you spell your last name? K-L-I-N-G-L-E-R. Thank you, sir. Mr. Klingler, did, uh, did you ever know a man named Guillermo Ariola? I had a couple of interactions with him, yes. Um, I am going to ask you to discuss with us uh, the, the time that you were in front of the Chavez res uh, 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 residence. Yes, and, and that was, to be sure, the only time I really interacted with him. Okay, so the, the, the other time you saw him but you didn't actually interact with him, is that right? Exactly, yes. Okay. So this time that you had an interaction with him, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, what were you doing at the Chavez residence? Uh, I had arrived there to, I, I think that time, I, I, I had responded to a Craigslist ad a few weeks before and I'd met Joe and Tanya and then that time I think I was there to drop something off. I think I was there to actually drop, to lend Joe some insulin if I remember correctly. Okay. Joe has diabetes and I have diabetes. Okay, and, and you initially responded to a Craigslist ad because you were purchasing some medical equipment, right? Exactly, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, so, so Joe and Tanya Chavez at this point in time, it doesn't sound like they were close friends of yours. No. Uh, these were just folks that you were having a transaction with. Yes. So when you arrived at their residence that day, were you able to enter their driveway? I, no. Uh, they kept their gate closed, and um, Tanya had asked me to immediately let her know um, when I arrived there because she wanted me to, she wanted to come out, open up the gate, and, and let me into the yard so that I could park inside the yard uh, because of some of their previous experiences with their neighbor. Okay. Uh, so, so, so when you arrived at the closed gate, what did you do? So it was uh, just right around sunset, and I turned the car off and turned my lights off and, um, and began texting Tanya just to let her know that I was there. Um, and, uh, and then... Uh, and what happened then? Well, what happened then was that somebody ba began banging on my car with a hammer. With a uh, what? With a hammer. Okay. Um, I looked in the rearview mirror, and I, somebody was just walking along my car, banging it with a hammer, and I knew immediately who it was because Tanya had described him to me. And you had never had an interaction with that man? No. You didn't have any previous beef with him? 
No, uh, uh, we had never met. Uh, no, I, I'd never had any inter interaction. The, the last time I had been at the Chavez residence, Objection. I had seen him Hold listening on. through the fence. Hold on. What's your objection? Um, Your Honor, I think that you can go to a 404A incident if you can approach. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what she's referring to, but I wasn't going to. I'm just going to move on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so... When the when you realize that there was someone banging on your car with a hammer, and let me ask you, were were they banging on your car with the hammer lightly or or hard? Uh, I'd say about me medium. It was about you know it was enough to make a dent uh, or to make dents. It left a little a series of dents down my car, and it was enough to break my he he broke my tail light as well. Broke your tail light. Uh huh. So what did you do? Well, I jumped out. Um, I, you know, I got out and, uh, and I was just trying not to lose my temper. And I said, why are you doing that? Now, and without saying what he said in response, did he do anything at that point in time? Uh, without saying what he said in response. Um, Physically, what did he do? Um, he, he did not do anything at that moment. Or, you know, he just continued to speak to me and hold the hammer. Did he threaten you with the hammer? Uh, a couple of sentences later, he did. His initial response was, I'm just Objection, teaching. Your Honor, here, okay. When you say that he threatened you with the hammer, just talk, t talk to us physically about what he did. OK. Um, well, uh, he brought the hammer back and said. Objection here, sir. Well, I think it's not being offered for the truth. I think it just goes to his state of mind. It, it is being offered for the truth. It is not being offered for the truth. Overruled. Just that. Brief. Go ahead, sir. So he pulled the hammer back, and what was that sentence he said? When I turned to him, he could see that, you know, I, I turned and looked at him, and he said, I will fuck you up. Okay. All right. I'll stop you right there. Okay. I'll pass the witness. <clears throat> Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So let's talk about this incident with the hammer. This was in 2018. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. And um, Mr. Audiolo, was he walking around your vehicle making dents or only at the back of the vehicle? Uh, he was walking up the driver's side. He just so, made a succession of, of dents up my driver's side. But not only in the back of the vehicle? Correct. He, he said he was teaching me a lesson okay, initially. Sir. You remember telling law enforcement that he had hit the back of your vehicle? Yes. So you never said all up the driver's side. You said the back of your vehicle. Is that correct? Uh, he started with the taillight and I'm then worked his you, way up. I'm asking you, do you remember telling law enforcement that he hit the back of your vehicle? You never told them all around your vehicle. Uh, I'll take your word for it. Objection. Do you remember doing a statement for law enforcement? I do. Do you remember in your written statement saying that he pounded on the back of your vehicle? Uh, I think that that might have been subject to their interpretation because it turned out later that there okay. was something else they wrote down. Let me stop you there, sir. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. She doesn't get to just he did on. answer the question. Can, now he's going to. Let's move on. Were you backing out of Joe and Tanya's driveway? No. No? You weren't backing out and almost hit Mr. Audiola with your Jeep? Oh, no. I had just arrived. And the car was turned off. Do you remember telling law enforcement that you were backing up and that you were looking and that there were some items back blocking your view? There were signs blocking your view. Do you remember saying that? I never would have said that. 
you remember doing a written statement to law enforcement? Yes. Okay. Would looking at that written witness statement refresh your memory? Well, what I understand is that law enforcement... Sir, the question is, is would looking at your witness statement refresh your memory what you said? Certainly. Just a couple of questions for you further, Mr. Klinger. Klingler, I apologize. I know I got it wrong before. Um, you said that Mr. Adiola had, you show, motioned to the jury how he had had the hammer in his hand, correct? Yes. And he was about four feet away from you when he did that? Uh, I say more like six. Okay. I, I remember the whole thing okay. pretty clearly. Okay. And um, you believe that this incident was an opportunity to do Joe and Tanya a favor, right? They had told me or... Is this, this is a yes or no question, sir. Object to the form of question. I don't understand what? what she's asking, and I don't think he does either. Okay, I'll ask it again. Okay. Sir, did you believe that this was an opportunity to do Joe and Tanya a favor? What was an opportunity? That's my question. What opportunity? Calling law, sorry. Was calling law enforcement an opportunity for you to do Joe and Tanya a favor? It, yes. It, okay. it, it, they had... Uh, there is some background to that if you okay. I, would allow me to no, go sir. into it. 
and during No further questions, Judge. Mr. Klingler, what's the background on you uh, uh, wanting to do Joe and Tanya a favor by calling law enforcement? Can we approach? How, how does she get to ask the question? Hold on, hold on, Counselor. I'm going to allow that question. Go ahead, sir. Well, they had called law enforcement many times without any sort of relief. And approach. Let me ask a more pointed question, uh, just to be clear. What you just indicated, you, you were talking about uh, the Chavez is calling law enforcement numerous times. Yes. And was it your understanding that they were calling law enforcement about Mr. Areola? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Kingley, you, you, you need to step down, okay? Excuse, be careful with that step. Don't you have your next witness available? We do, Your Honor. The defense would call Aaron Bruden up to the stand. Good afternoon. Let me show you. You swear or affirm your testimony you're about to give the truth on the penalty of law. I do. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, my name is Aaron Brudenell. I can spell that. It's two A's, R-O-N, and Brudenell is B-R-U-D-E-N-E-L-L. -L. And, sir, where are you employed? Um, I'm currently employed full-time with the Arizona Department of Public Safety in the Crime Laboratory in Tucson. And how long have you been employed with the Arizona Department of Public Safety? Since 2007. And what do you do for the Arizona Department of Public Safety? I'm a firearm and tool mark expert. What are tool marks? Uh, tool marks essentially are any usually microscopic marks left behind when a tool interacts with some other object. Uh, for example, in the firearm context, the tools used to manufacture a firearm typically leave very unique and identifiable marks behind on the firearm and then subsequently those marks get transferred to fired ammunition. So that type of examination is the type of work a firearm examiner usually does. And do you have any degrees? Yes, I have a uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's degree in analytical chemistry, which is more focused on the analysis of chemical substances. And do you have any other educational background? I do. Um, my firearm and tool mark education, my forensic education for what I do, uh, came from the ATF's National Firearm Examiner Academy. It's a year-long course of study that started in 1999. I was in the second class, um, so 
approximately a dozen students go through a year-long course of study covering all topics in firearm forensics. What is the ATF? Oh, ATF is the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Um, they were formerly part of the Treasury Department. Now they're part of the Justice Department. All right, and you indicated that you have a master's degree in analytical chemistry. Yes. And when you were obtaining your master's degree, were you a graduate research assistant? Uh, yes, I was. And what, it, what areas did you study or conduct research in when you were a grad student? Um, the research I worked on was essentially um, ion molecule interactions uh, like mass spectrometers. This is very technical, but the, the simplest application are when you see the screening devices at the airport where they might run a swab across your luggage or your hand, put into a piece of equipment to analyze for trace substances such as explosives. That's the type of research I was focused on. And after you uh, obtained your master's degree, where did you first uh, go to work? Uh, my first uh, job in forensics was with the Idaho State Police. I was hired in their crime laboratory in Pocatello, Idaho, where I started training and did casework as a toxicologist. And your casework as a toxicologist, what did that entail? Um, largely analysis of urine samples and also testimony. Excuse me, let me back up. Largely the analysis of urine samples for uh, substances, controlled substances and other impairing substances and their metabolites. But additionally, I did work with uh, breath alcohol analysis. So that's the type of alcohol analysis that's usually done either in the field or in, say, a police station for testing a person's breath for the level of alcohol intoxication. And you mentioned that you would also testify in your scope of work? Yes, I've testified in both those areas before. Okay. And were you testifying as an expert in those areas? Yes, I was. And did that, uh, that work include uh, drugs such as cocaine? Yes, cocaine is one of the common drugs and its metabolites that we would see um, routinely in urine samples, for example. And alcohol? Uh, yes, alcohol as well. After the um, Idaho State Police, where did you go? Um, once I uh, was at the Idaho State Police, I got my training in firearms and worked cases there. I worked briefly for the Washington State Patrol after that, uh, about a year and a half. And then I moved to Arizona where I worked for the Tucson Police Department in their crime laboratory in the firearm and toolmark section. How long were you at the Tucson Police Department? About three and a half years. And you said you worked in their firearm and toolmark department? Yes, um, I did some brief drug chemistry while I was there, but for the most part, I was focused on firearm and toolmark forensics. And uh, when you're doing firearm and toolmark forensics, what does that entail? Um, a most common firearm case might be receiving a gun in evidence and examining it for operability, seeing if the safety features function, seeing if it's safe to fire. Um, the next probably more common and, co and less and more complicated analysis would be looking at those test fires under a microscope and then comparing them to evidence that may have been recovered from a scene, such as a fired bullet or a fired cartridge case. Did your work with the Tucson Police Department include reconstruction of shootings? To a limited degree, I did reconstruction of shooting incidents at Tucson Police Department, but I would say the bulk of my reconstruction work happened once I moved to my p current position at the state. And did your work at the Tucson Police Department include processing of crime scenes? Uh, not at that, that department. I did some crime scene work in the Idaho State Police. Okay. And did you ever testify when you were at the Tucson Police Department? Yes, I did. And in what areas were you testifying? Uh, almost all of my testimony was in either firearm and toolmark work or reconstruction. And was that as an expert? Yes, that's correct. And then where did you move after Tucson Police Department? Uh, currently where I, where I currently am at the uh, Arizona Department of Public Safety. Same city, just a different agency, statewide agency in a different laboratory. And when did you start with the Arizona uh, Department of Public Safety? 2007. And what do you do for the Arizona Department of Public Safety? If you could kind of walk us through your career there. Sure, and it's essentially stayed the same since I started. I work on routine firearm and toolmark cases and do shooting incident reconstruction case work as well. Anything having to do with firearm forensics or a shooting incident, that's what I'm tasked to. Do you also assist in training employees? Uh, yes, I do that as part of my job. We'll train uh, sometimes new employees on basic firearm safety and handling. Um, all the way to having, um, so a new firearm examiner, if they were hired, I might participate in their training as well. 
And have you testified as an expert um, during your time at the Arizona Department of Public Safety? Yes, many times. And what areas do you testify as an expert in? Uh, firearm and tool mark analysis and shooting incident reconstruction. Do you know how many times you've testified as an expert in those areas? I do not. Um, we routinely have our testimony reviewed once a year. So I would say with only one exception I can recall, I've testified every year that I've worked there and usually more often than just once. Which courts have you testified in as an expert? Um, I've testified in um, criminal courts in Idaho, uh, in Washington State, in Arizona, uh, Illinois, Kansas, Colorado, and here in New Mexico. I believe that's the full list. I've also testified in federal courts in some of those jurisdictions too. And have you ever conducted um, any trainings or taught any classes? Yes, on a number of occasions I've taught uh, shooting incident reconstruction, for example, and other uh, related coursework. I've done it for different organizations from time to time. Um, National Institute of Justice, uh, West Virginia University, uh, the Arizona Department, excuse me, the Arizona, the Arizona Homicide Investigators Association. Those are some of the more common ones. Are you also an instructor for the ATF? Yes, uh, the academy where I attended in 2000-2001 uh, brought me back as an instructor in 2004. Have you taught classes on trajectory? Yes, I, I've done that type of casework, or excuse me, classwork in classes involving shooting reconstruction, and I did a specific online class for a group called RTI, which is a research organization and training organization in North Carolina. It was called the Four Elements of Trajectory, so it focused on specifically the trajectory aspects of shooting reconstruction. Have you taught classes um, regarding firearm evidence for prosecutors? Um, I, ha I have tried, at least. I've done these, this course that I called Firearm Evidence for Investigators, Attorneys, um, et cetera, and some prosecutors have participated in that. And one course in particular uh, that was for the Pima County um, uh, attorney's office, we did a firearm forensic specific uh, course. Have you written any articles or books that have been published? I have written some articles that have been published and I've also participated as a co-author in doing research for some other articles as well. And in what areas have you been published? Um, gunshot residue, um, I'm, I'm kind of blanking on the other, some of the others, but the gunshot residue part of, uh, aspects are the most common in my field in terms of stuff that I've published or participated in publishing. Have you published or participated in articles regarding flash suppressors? Um, yes, I did an article um, that was published in a, it was a magazine as well as a forensic journal that focused on um, the uh, relationship between flash hider design and also barrel length and how those interacted. Have you received specialized or advanced training in any, in any areas? Uh, yes, a variety. I, uh, my CV usually lists all of the individual trainings I've received um, uh, going into either forensic meetings or specific training I've gotten from specific organizations as well. And some of that advanced training, would that be in firearm and tool marks? I would say most of it is either firearm, tool mark analysis, or related fields such as shooting reconstruction, or in some cases other types of pattern analysis. And advanced training in crime scene analysis? Yes, I've had some of that as well. And some advanced training in chemistry? <coughs> uh, yes, I believe so. And advanced training in toxicology? It's been a few years, but yes, I've had some training in toxicology as well. And have you toured any firearm facilities? Yes. As Part of my initial training and continuing on as the opportunities present themselves, I will take advantage of opportunities to tour either firearm or ammunition manufacturing facilities. And why do you tour those facilities? A number of reasons. Um, the firearm facilities are useful for seeing the process of how guns are manufactured because we use the manufacturing marks in part to do our job of identifying individual fired bullets and cartridge cases to specific firearms seeing the process and how they're manufactured is useful. Uh, for example, uh, most farms have a serial number, but it, it may surprise you to learn that the gun that has the second serial number to the first gun may not have been made at the same time. They make parts in batches and then the guns are assembled from the parts that are made. So you could have two guns that have the same, or excuse me, similar serial numbers that were made some time apart. That's just one example. Um, ammunition factories are probably 
equally useful, but for different reasons, seeing how the manufacturers uh, use the raw materials and assemble them into complete ammunition. Occasionally marks may be left behind that you wouldn't want to confuse for marks that could be used to link a fired cartridge or bullet to a gun. Also the different manufacturing uh, type, the different manufacturing technologies and also the different manufacturing processes will show you things that might help you identify the brand of an ammunition or some other important aspect of something that may have been recovered at a shooting incident. How many facilities have you toured? I don't recall um, the numbers in, I would say, in the dozens. Would that include uh, SIG Arms? Um, I did tour a SIG Arms facility, uh, I believe, in 2000, um, and it was the facility in Exeter, New Hampshire. Your Honor, at this time, the defense would uh, tender Mr. Brudenell as an expert in firearm examination and shooting reconstruction. Thank you. I'm not a toxicologist. And toxicology. And Your Honor, I would um, object to that. Can we approach? You may. All right, so to be clear then, uh, Mr. Brudenell is qualified as an expert in firearm and tool mark and shooting reconstruction. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Brudenell, have you been provided with any information regarding this case that we're here for today? Yes, I received a number of documents, um, photographs, um, recordings of interviews and transcripts, things of that nature. And did you review those materials? I did. And what was your purpose in reviewing those materials? Uh, essentially to do what I could to evaluate the, um, the evidence available to me um, in the context of the incident. And in reviewing that evidence, um, did you make note of any, any items or any investigation that was missing that could have been useful? Um, there are a number of things that can go into a shooting reconstruction, and if I can pause briefly to elaborate. Please. Um, when you do a traditional forensic examination where you offer a firearm or an unknown substance to a crime lab, um, the analysis is fairly simple and straightforward. It may be technically difficult, but it, it's a straightforward answer that you get at the end of that process. The firearm may be decide, determined to be operable or inoperable, and that will be listed on a report. The substance may be identified. This is a controlled substance, and it's cocaine, or this is a uh, non-controlled substance, or something of that nature. Um, but a forensic reconstruction is very different. It's interpretive. And what that means is a forensic reconstruction usually involves assembling as much information and data as you can, both from, say, a crime scene and from forensic analysis that happens at the laboratory. And the way I like to describe your result at the end of that process is you have a filter. You have a series of facts and information you can use to sort out different scenarios, to try to decide if one scenario under those circumstances that you've identified is possible or, say, impossible, or if one of those scenarios is more likely, say, than another. And so when the, you're, you're done with a forensic reconstruction, hopefully you have a better picture of what happened, but you will almost never have a perfect picture of what happened. You may have some information that will help you sort out certain facts, say the sequence of shots fired, or you may not. It's very difficult to be sure. Uh, a perfect reconstruction would involve a number of things, uh, including trajectory analysis and measurements. Um, 
So in this case, when you reviewed the evidence, this is the evidence that was gathered by Sandoval County Sheriff's Office and the New Mexico State Police. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. And have you ever reviewed cases that involved either of those agencies before? I would say a number of times I have, yes. And so are you familiar with the work of those agencies? Somewhat, yes. And in reviewing the work that was conducted in this case, were there certain areas that you felt there could have been more follow-up done? I think there are always going to be other things that could have been done, additional work. And if you're doing the reconstruction, you're trying to answer the questions that are posed to you. Um, but specifically in this case, there were a number of bullet impacts inside the structure and some traveling outside of the structure. Uh, those bullet impacts were photographed and they were labeled, very important parts of the process. Um, in some cases, trajectory rods were placed to indicate the bullet paths as they went through certain structures. Um, but what wasn't done were um, specific photographs or measurements um, that would allow you to document the exact trajectories more accurately. Um, and there wasn't, that I saw, a evaluation of the whole scene that included information on bullet trajectories that may be incomplete. For example, a bullet striking the floor at a shallow angle. Um, some other information that might be useful is to try to determine if that bullet struck that flooring and ricocheted or if it went through the flooring and entered some space underneath the house. Um, those are the types of information that I would have liked to have seen if possible and possibly some other information in, um, on specific materials such as uh, what the flooring was made of exactly. Why would that be helpful to know what the flooring was made of? Um, in some cases you will see different effects depending such, such on, for example, the, the thickness of say flooring material or the what it's constructed from. In this case I have a pretty good idea what the flooring is made from and but how thick it is um, or other in information of what might be below it was, was lacking. Um, and you had mentioned impact sites, the different impact sites at the scene. Yes. Is there testing that could be done on those impact sites that help you to, I guess, sort of construct that filter that you had mentioned? Uh, yes, and I was able to do some of that testing. Okay. And what other types of testing is there? Is there like some kind of chemical testing that could be conducted? Um, there's, yeah, two things in particular. Some chemical testing may be useful. Um, the residues of gunshots that are fired at close distances to objects often leave residues that are, if not visible, can be made visible through chemistry. Um, there's also um, other things that can be observed, such as physical impacts. Um, sometimes the residues from a shot that's fired at close range are visible. Sometimes they're not visible, but can be made visible with oblique lighting or other techniques that enhance, say, the magnification of the surface you're looking at either a very close photograph taken with a macro lens or in some cases even a photograph taken with some form of magnification so you can see individual particle impacts on the surface. And why would individual particle impacts on the surface be important? What that can give you in some cases is a, a better estimate of the distance and in maybe some other cases the angle at which a shot was fired. Um, essentially when a gun is fired the bullet leaves the barrel at a high speed, but following that bullet out of the barrel are a number of residues, including unburned particles of powder that are also leaving at approximately the same speed. Now, a bullet does not slow down very fast cutting through air, but small lightweight particles of powder do. So once you get a certain distance away, those particles of powder will disperse in their area and also lose velocity so they don't produce the same kind of impacts. <laughs> For example, you might be very close to an object and have lots of visible residues. You might be a little farther away and have impacts from these particles that leave small um, visible or barely visible damage to that surface. And once you get farther away, sometimes all you have are the particles themselves adhering to the surface. And some of these things can be seen easily. Some of them will take some techniques to visualize. But in any case, that kind of information may help you get an idea for a particular impact, how close or far the gun was and in some cases even what was the orientation of the firearm in space at the moment that particular shot was fired. And there's been some discussion in this case regarding gunshot residue analysis. What is that? Uh, well, there's a couple types. Um, the initial uh, term, gunshot residue, is probably very broad. We use it in forensic contexts usually in two ways. 
One way would be to identify, say, the distance a shot may have been fired from an object, as I just described. There is another technique that's uh, trace gunshot residue. That's how I describe it. It's looking for particles of residue that are not visible to the human eye on, say, skin or clothing to identify if a person was in the vicinity of a gunshot or participated as a shooter, for example. And is gunshot residue analysis something that a crime lab can do? Yes, um, mostly the former type. The latter type of that trace residue is only done by a few specific laboratories, and it has limited probative value depending on the circumstances of an incident. The other type is more commonly performed in most modern crime laboratories. And when you have a gunshot victim who's wearing clothing, and yes. you're trying to determine the distance of the firearm from, the, from that person when they were shot, does the gunshot residue analysis assist in that? It can, and normally what happens in those circumstances are the clothing itself is delivered as evidence to, to the crime laboratory, and that, that, la that item of evidence is analyzed by the laboratory for that purpose. And do you know if the New Mexico Department of Public Safety has the ability to do this type of analysis? They do. <clears throat> what about ejection pattern analysis? What is that? An ejection pattern analysis takes advantage of looking at the way cartridge cases are ejected from a firearm, uh, typically the distance and the direction they travel. If I hold a firearm and I'm pointing in a certain direction, in more cases than not, the cartridge cases that are fired, if they're ejected from the firearm in a semi-automatic gun, for example, they come out of the gun, they typically go right into the rear slightly, but that's a, a rough estimate. Every gun and ammunition combination can be a little different. So the value of analyzing the ejection pattern would be to see the distance and maybe the direction of cartridge cases and how they travel through air and where they land. And does the ejection pattern analysis have some limitations? It does. Um, for one thing, it's um, a pattern, so you're not going to put too much weight on any individual data point. You, know, you may have 12 cartridge cases that all land in a pile and one or two others that go far and wide. Well, that can happen. Um, also, the limitations would include you'd have to have some information or knowledge or understanding of where the, car the firearm was held and at what position because if I'm standing and aiming level, the cartridge ejection pattern may be very different than if I'm, say, sitting down and holding the gun at a 45-degree angle. Those are things that can affect it. Orientation can also affect it. If I have a gun, such as a rifle, and it's typically ejecting to the right, if I suddenly turn it sideways, it's going to start ejecting upward, for example. So those sorts of things can have an impact. And when you're, oh, I'm sorry. Apologies. The, the last thing I think that is significant is the environment. And what, is, what I mean by that is uh, the simplest example is if you were firing a, a gun and the cartridge cases are landing, say, on a grassy field, they will typically land once and not bounce and stay right where they first hit. If, on the other hand, you're standing on a sidewalk or an asphalt or some rigid structure, those cartridge cases will typically hit and then bounce, and they may go a different direction and vary after that point. Lastly, if you're in a confined space, cartridge cases can hit objects in the confined space, hit walls, they tend to bounce around. So the utility of doing this type of work starts to become limited in those conditions. And while we're talking about casings, uh, as part of your shooting reconstruction, do you look at where casings are found? Yes, I do take note of that. And if there is some information to be gleaned from that, oftentimes I'll try to incorporate that in my analysis. And the location of casings, can that also have limitations? Yes. And what would those limitations be? Very much the same. It's, we're talking about the same process. If I find casings all in one spot, that's useful if it's an open air shooting scene. On the other hand, if they're in a confined space like a car or a small room, the location of those casings, or at least the specific location within that room, may be of limited value because those casings, like I said, can hit and they can bounce. Um, it would really depend on the specifics of the circumstance. And what I have found is unless the question is, was the person in the room or out of the room, confined spaces are usually limited to just that type of answer. And you mentioned that you had reviewed the evidence in this case. Is that correct? Yes, I reviewed what I was provided. And do you recall what you were provided? Uh, I don't have the full list committed to memory, um, but again, as I said, a large number of photographs, um, some, some transcripts, and some other 
information of that type, uh, specifically uh, the lab report from the New Mexico State Crime Laboratory and the conclusions within that as well. And did you happen to see if there was any testing done of a, a firearm by the Department of Public Safety in this case? Uh, yes, there was. And what kind of testing was done? Uh, kind of what I described, routine uh, test firing and operability testing was done. Um, I'm, I'm remembering mostly the SIG rifle because that's the gun I focused on. Um, also, the uh, ammunition itself, the fired cartridge cases that were provided or that were recovered, excuse me, were compared and they were also identified to that particular rifle. Did you conduct any testing in this case? Uh, yes, I did. What kind of uh, testing did you do? Um, what I took note of were the visible scorch patterns seen on the floor of the location on two of the shots in particular. And I tried to find a way to reproduce those patterns and see what it would tell me about a possible firearm location and orientation. So and I did, oh. Oh, go ahead. So, so I did a series of test firings with a similar gun and similar ammunition on samples of flooring material to see if I could reproduce those, those patterns. And did you prepare anything to aid the jury in um, understanding your testing? Yes, I prepared sort of a series of uh, essentially PowerPoint slides, um, individual uh, pages that can be reviewed to show what, how, how that process took place and what the results were. Your Honor, at this point in time, we would ask to be able to publish the slides um, as demonstrative aids to assist the jury in understanding Mr. Brutadel's testing. It'll be allowed for demonstrative purposes. Are you going to use your laptop there or is it uh, the document camera? I'm going to use the document camera right now. Okay. Is it on? I don't see a visual here, so I'm not sure. <laughs> it's firing up. Sure. If everyone can see that, I'll begin. Um, this is the uh, firearm and the ammunition from the shooting incident. The rifle you can see below, um, I think we've seen it earlier today, it's a SIG model uh, 556 rifle. Um, it's very similar to an AR-15 in some respects. It's also different in others. Um, this particular firearm has a 16-inch barrel based on my analysis of the image and similar products. Uh, the ammunition is photographed above. Um, the green tip ammunition is a common uh, U.S. military type of ammunition um, and it's got a specific bullet weight and usually a head stamp which is the markings on the back of the cartridge you can see in the circular image below or to the left excuse me and that is uh, LC19. LC stands for Lake City that's the name of the arsenal that makes the ammunition and 19 usually refers to the year of manufacture so that's what you're seeing in this image. Um, I did not have access to this particular firearm or an identical model and the ammunition I could find was similar but it was from a different date. So um, my test equipment that I use for generating test fires will be shown in the next image. <coughs> so again, the same type of ammunition and also a head stamp that has just a date that's five years prior, so LC14. The rifle is an AR-15 rifle with a 16-inch barrel. Um, and more specifically for both firearms, we look at the next slide. Mm -hmm. The muzzle device on the front of the barrel, this is a device called a flash hider. It's typically designed to reduce the amount of visible flash that's seen when a gun of this type is shot. And both the uh, firearm from the shooting incident and the one I used for testing had a flash hider that has slits only on the upper half of the actual device. And so to be clear, in this slide that we're looking at, where did you get this photo, the top photo from? The top photo is a photo of the firearm that was recovered in this incident. It was shown in, I think, in the box that it was packaged in, and that's just a close-up of that muzzle of that image. And this photo? Uh, that's one I took at the range in preparation for my test firing. Okay. 
And the fact that you're not using the exact, the, the exact gun and the exact ammunition, uh, like how does that play into the results? Well, I would say it adds some extra unknown. Um, and in particular, were I to get um, a pattern that I felt represented the pattern that I saw, I would only treat that as an approximation. Um, I would not assert with any kind of certainty the, the exact muzzle to target distance. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you would want to have a more precise um, combination of exact similarities from your testing and the original incident. Um, but for the purposes of this, it was easy to see in the basic format a firearm and how the various patterns change as the angles change and get a, a rough approximation of where this firearm would have been at the time those two particular shots were fired. And so why are we focusing on the flash hider that was in the last? The reason the flash hider is important is that because those vents are only on the top half of that circular flash hider, that means that the vents that are going to release those residues that are visible at very close distances are only going to be on the top. So for example, if I was shooting underneath a windowsill, a very low top of a windowsill, I would expect to see those flash patterns there. I wouldn't expect to see them if I was on the bottom edge of a windowsill shooting out of a window because those flash patterns would be directed upward. In this case, the patterns that were seen on the flooring in the shooting incident scene had those patterns on them. What that told me was that rifle was essentially inverted. It was upside down. At some point, the gun was held in the opposite orientation that a normal shooter would hold it which would be with the grip facing down and the magazine down and those ports upward. In this case, stop you there for please. A um, I would like to actually show you the firearm that's been tagged in the Barrel. permission, I'd like to verify this is an unloaded gun safe. Yes. You can just visually see the chamber is empty. There's nothing inside the gun in either the chamber or the magazine area. So this gun has no ammunition in it, so it should be perfectly safe to handle. Okay. And so this firearm, is this the firearm that you were looking at in the photos? Yes, I believe so. Okay, and when you're talking about the flash hider, can you please show us what you're talking about? Yes, right here is the flash hider device, and it may be difficult to see from a distance, but the area on the bottom where the grip and the magazine are is solid. There are no holes on this portion of the flash hider. But on the sides and the top are where those ports exist. Um, the intention of this, I think, initially is to keep the blast uh, going upward rather than going downward. Uh, but as a practical effect, if it's fired close to a, uh, an object that records those flash, those, those patterns, you can get some indication of the orientation of the firearm in space. And so when I say that the firearm was inverted or upside down, I would approximate using this as a, a stand-in for the floor, it was in some sort of orientation approximating angles of this type. So upside down and at some angle, this direction, shallow angle. Furthermore, it may have been tilted slightly one way or the other, but for the most part, it was in an upside down orientation at the time those shots were fired. And is that a typical way to fire a rifle? Not really. <clears throat> Should we move on to your next slide? Sure. Okay. So these are the two images that were taken by investigators at the scene. Um, you can't read the label below, but it's items I-11 and I-12. Those are the impacts that are recorded and described in this photograph. If you see the kind of gray-black pattern surrounding those impacts, there is a close pattern which has sort of a, just a parabolic shape to it. But then farther away are the individual little patterns that correspond to those open ports on the flash hider. If you look at I-12, which is the lower one, you can see three of them. And if you look at I-11, you can see two. Um, what I found interesting was also that the distance between the actual impact site 
the damage physically done to the floor and where that um, cone of residues appears, they kind of just overlap. Right about the time the bullet impact starts is right about the time that that larger pattern starts to dissipate. Okay. Should we move on to the next one? Yes, please. So now we had talked about your testing that you had done in this case. Does this show some of your testing? Yes, it does. So to approximate this on the range, I got samples of similar type of flooring material and I set them up using a vise and another apparatus with some clamps to put them in at a specific angle. Now, as I said, the images from the scene show the gun being held upside down, but it's very impractical to do that in a range, and this was a much easier way to reproduce angles and patterns. So, for example, this particular image that you see on the left shows a side view where you can see the, the ports in the upper half of the, of the muzzle device, and the structure that's being fired at is at approximately a 45 degree angle where I could actually use a scale below or direct measurements to see how far away that particular flash hider was from the surface of the wood. Um, the other image is just a view from behind, approximately where the shooter would be standing, observing how this testing was done. I think the next slide's more, more useful. So this shows four of those test samples. And the one that was the first one done would be in the upper right, and that was at 45 degrees, and at a distance about three inches. And so that's essentially what had more or less in the photograph you saw before. And at that distance and at that angle, I was not able to visualize any of those muzzle patterns. So none of that dark, sooty uh, shapes that showed the location or the distance. There were other visible patterns, and they might be something you can see in there. There's small light specks around the area of the bullet impact. And Those, you can touch the screen and pop sure. it, actually. Thank you. That's that sort of zone where those individual particle impacts are striking the surface of the wood and producing slight damage. Uh, these can be visible in photography, but may not be visible in all cases. So at three inches, this thing was close enough to still do some tiny microscopic damage to the surface that could be evaluated for the purposes of distance. Um, the other samples, when compared, um, I felt that the one at the bottom left, the contact shot where the muzzle is actually in contact with the surface and the angle is 20 degrees, most approximated the residues I saw. So you have that pattern that, as I said, the dark pattern that starts to dissipate at the spot where the bullet hole starts. So right in here you have the pattern dissipating and you also have the bullet impact starting there. And then you have the individual, in this case four, visible patterns of the actual residues themselves. Um, this one up above has three that I can see. Apologize for that. Uh, this one also has several. But what you'll notice with this one and with this one the location of that sort of central residue pattern isn't at the same relative location. Now, I wouldn't be comfortable ruling out these other two possibilities based on the differences that we described. The, the firearm is a different firearm with some different properties, and the ammunition is slightly different based on a difference of five years of manufacturing. So I wouldn't swear that any of these are absolutely accurate as far as determining the distance. But as you can see, for the most part, you have to be fairly close in my test set, under three inches, and contact being fairly reliable. And you have to have the firearm in an orientation where those ports are producing marks, individual marks, um, that show that the gun was essentially upside down at the time. Next slide. Please. And so to try to reproduce these specific samples, um, I used a, a firearm, the same firearm, in an orientation in a contact position. You ready for the next slide? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. And again, this is just close-up photographs of those two test shots that you just saw after they were produced with a scale and showing the direction of the shot travel. Um, and these, like I said, approximate what was seen 
at those two shots, impact 11 and 12 at the scene. Next. What are we looking at here? So this is a view from, I believe, a Google Earth or Google Map of the site. Or in this case, no, I, I correct myself, I believe that's a, an aerial view that was taken by investigators at the scene. Um, this particular area in the highlighted area, the red zones, the rectangles, show the locations of where the impacts were recorded inside and on their way out of the structure. And so I wanted to try to roughly diagram those based on the photographs that were offered. And the next slide should show a diagram. So in this case, I was focused on the trajectory rods that were made um, visible by investigators. They place a rod into a bullet path that tries to approximate the location and the angles and the directionality of that particular shot. Um, there were three going through the interior door between the mudroom and the hallway. Those are the ones in the center circle in green. And there were also three that went through the exterior wall and I believe a, a a heating or some other unit that was in its path. So the individual photographs you can see to the right and above in this diagram image. Now the trajectory rods were placed, giving sort of a rough estimate of where the shots passed through and at what proximate angles. Uh, they weren't measured though, at least not that I could tell. And the photographs weren't of particular angles that were useful for taking measurements because sometimes you can take measurements directly off a of photo if the photograph is done in a precise way. Um, the other thing that is lacking and, and may may not have been determinable is whether or not those three shots going through the door are also the same three shots that went through the wall. Uh, bullets can travel through a number of structures. Uh, the next images show uh, the actual impacts through the door itself. And it's a bit of a close up showing the, the shots as they are going into the door from the inside heading outwards. Um, and in this case, if you look, you can see that the holes through the actual door itself, those holes are not round. The holes indicate sort of an oval shape. And what that tells me is at the moment these shots all struck this door, they were likely destabilized by one of two possibilities. Either uh, something in the relationship of the firearm that's not properly stabilizing the bullets, such as the incorrect twist of rifling or something like that, some defect or these bullets may have struck some other surface on their way. These might be continuations of other impacts that hit the hallway and then ricocheted off the flooring. At this point, I can't say either way. What are we looking at here? So this is a view of that hallway. And what I'll point out, and we'll see, I think I, think I have a better view of it as well, but there's another shot here. The three shots that we just saw going through the doorway are all through here. And you can't see them in this image because they're blocked by the door wall. But the uh, one through the actual corner itself that you can see has a trajectory rod through it. And there are additional impacts that are marked and labeled on the floor. You can see several of them here. And those shots were identified and marked and individually photographed. My next to process was to look at those individual photographs since I couldn't see any residues, I wanted to see if the shape of the bullet impact gave me any information on directionality. Now there's two types of directionality uh, measurements you can get for most bullet paths. There's what we call elevation angle, which just means how upward or downward is that bullet path relative to gravity. And the second thing is what we would call an azimuth or a horizontal or a bird's eye view, which is what you would see if you were looking straight down. And that was what I was more focused on. That angle, that virtual visual top-down view would give an indication of which direction through the structure these bullets were flying. And if they were hitting at a shallow angle, I could see that. If they were hitting at a steeper angle, they would be more difficult to determine because that shot would not be, it'd be closer to a round hole rather than a linear hole that would point in the direction of bullet travel. And why is that important in this case? Well, in this case, I think there was some question about whether or not there was a struggle. And one of the things that I thought lent itself to a struggle besides the orientation of a firearm leaving those residue patterns we already discussed would be a very shallow impact. You know, uh, somebody, somebody firing a gun very low to the ground 
unless you're lying prone in a deliberate fashion, that might also be indicative of shots fired during a struggle while the gun is being forced away from somebody and held low. Are we done with this slide? Yes. What are we looking at here? So this is inside that room, um, looking at slightly different angle. This shows additional impacts. These are the ones we've already discussed, 11 and 12. Here are some other impacts here. Um, I don't believe these are impacts. I believe these are blood marks. I don't recall specifically. But also showing the location in that room where these individual impacts were. And as you'll start to see, once I look at the diagram, these impacts were going in this direction. Um, both 11, 12, and the one next to it, which is, I think was number 10, but it's in my diagram if we go to the next slide, I believe. Before we move to your next slide, though, please. the location of impact sites 10, 11, and 12, was that interesting to you, or does that say anything to you? Yes. Um, it's easier to see when you get the whole diagram, but the bulk of the trajectories were at least going this direction, down the hallway, but these were running in a very different direction. These were more or less parallel. Okay. Yeah, that's probably good. <laughs> okay. um, the red arrows are indicating what I'm, my finger is doing a mediocre job of drawing. Uh, the red arrows show the indications of where these individual impacts were and what their angles were relative to a bird's eye view. So we have multiple trajectory angles illustrated here. What's almost as interesting are these impacts that I can't make that determination because they were fired at a steeper angle. And again, if the firearm is fired downward at a steeper angle, that may also be indicative of some kind of struggle for the gun because it's, that's, there's not a reason to do that short of maybe a warning shot or something of that nature or an accident. And what about impact 14? Um, 14 parallels going down the hallway. That's at a slightly different angle than the ones that appeared to be going through the door and also exiting the structure with the purple trajectory rods in the, some of the previous slides. Um, but other than that, I can't comment more than just that kind of angle. So how many different directions do we have bullets flying at this scene? I would say there are, um, it's unknown at this point. Um, there are at least, if you want to simplify and keep 14, uh, 9, and these 8, with the arrow all together with the group that are going through the door and the group that are going out the side of the wall, all those could be roughly described as a direction that way. But there's going to be some variation. But these, this group, this cluster, all appears to be going 90 degrees from them. And in particular, um, other impacts without that kind of directionality that I could determine from photographs could be in a totally different direction if for no other reason they're not being fired at a shallow angle to make ricochet or slight shallow impacts on the floor, they would be fired at a different angle, so something steeper. So once you consider three dimensions, I would say we have at least three likely sets of trajectory angles that these, car these fired um, bullet impacts would uh, fall into. And when you have these three different angles, what does that tell you about the, about the scene? Uh, what that tells me is uh, it supports the likelihood of a struggle for the firearm uh, because uh, a deliberate attempt to shoot at those angles doesn't really make any sense. Um, if people are fighting over a gun and it's going off in the process, that would help go a long way to explain different trajectory angles and also different vertical angles and even different orientations where the gun's upside down and in contact with the floor. That's a very unusual angle, and I felt that was the most compelling. Okay, and we're talking about those impact sites with the scorch marks that you tried to replicate in your testing. That's correct. Okay. I mean, is that something you see a lot in shooting reconstruction? I would say not often, and um, we do see things like that. Sometimes you just see a muzzle blast. Um, the firearm would have to have a muzzle device of that type, and then the muzzle device of that type would have to be in a location during the shooting event where it could produce it. But I have seen that before in some instances. Um, before we move on... Um, the other three trajectory aspects I wanted to focus on were the ones through the body, through the decedent. There were two wounds to the decedent, um, one to the head and then one to the, the chest. Both were described by the medical examiner as um, top to bottom, right to left. So if you're seeing me passing through me in this direction, as well as in the diagram, 
but no front or backward orientation. So these projectiles are essentially slicing straight through at this type of angle. Um, that's an unusual angle. If someone were shot while they were standing below a shooter, that would make sense. But in this case, given the likelihood of uh, a shooter being in a position that's on or near the ground, that body would have to be pivoted in such a way at the waist that it is point oriented mostly in that level. So bent at the waist, pointed, if not forward, slightly to the left of the shooter's position if both of those were produced at the same instant. Now, I can't sequence these shots. I can't say that the two shots through the body or the third shot I've described, which is a, a gray shot we'll show you in a moment. I can't say those were fired simultaneously or all at the same time, but that seems to be the most likely scenario. Based on the location where the body fell and was found, it was, I think it's unlikely those shots would have been delivered after that incident. And you were in the courtroom when Mr. Cummings was testifying today, is that correct? Yes, I was. And you heard his description of what happened that day? I did. And would you agree that what he's describing as this altercation where he's on the floor doing this crab crawl back, and as he's trying to stand up... Objection reading? A little out a little bit. And as he's, thank you, Your Honor. And as he's standing up, he starts to shoot as Mr. Ariola is coming at him, would that be consistent with what you see here? It could be, yes. Um, I think the next image shows um, the grays that I was describing. So what are we looking at here? So this is the decedent in the position where he was found and located after the incident. Um, as I said, there's two wound paths that go through the body that approximate this angle. There's also a shot that grazes the clothing and did not produce a wound, but it also parallels those two trajectories, which is to say it's skimming across the back through the clothing at the same angle and at the surface of the actual garment itself where it wouldn't produce a wound. So I regarded all three of those as parallel trajectories relative to the body, even though only two of them produced injuries. Next slide. Please, yeah. <coughs> One other thing I noted uh, was the front scope cover was missing. It had been pulled off and also broken. There's two parts to it. You can see there's the lid that flips up and down, and there's also the, the circular rubber section that goes directly on the scope and holds that in place. Um, having this thing separated uh, could also have been done during a struggle because someone grappling for the gun could easily get a hold of that part and turn it or pull it and separate it from the gun and break it into two pieces. And did you see any evidence um, that there was electrical tape that had actually been used to secure the scope to the cap to the scope? Uh, yes, there appeared to be when the firearm was photographed upon recovery, it had some tape that was around the scope itself. And that's usually done to uh, build up the circular surface area that the uh, scope cover is attaching to. The tighter the fit, the more likely it is to stay intact during use. So one last thing, um, these are photographs of the defendant's hands, specifically on this hand, which is the left hand. There are two sort of dark, I would call them, scorch marks or dark residues. Um, they could be from a number of sources, but one of the things I have seen before and experienced personally is if a firearm is being held in an orientation or a location where the residues are coming out of the gun at that spot, you can occasionally get those residues deposited on your hand. Um, I'll use this gun as an example. If I was holding the firearm in a normal orientation for firing, I would be gripping the pistol grip with my right hand, and the left hand would be underneath this part here. Uh, residues, though, may be coming out of the gun, not just at the muzzle, but also at the ejection port, possibly through these vents up top or below, and also through this area here. Um, I, I didn't have the opportunity to test this ammunition and this firearm to see at what point those residues could come. But to the extent that those residues could be produced um, from areas of the gun that aren't normally held by the shooter, finding residues on a hand could be indicative of the gun being held at an unusual position or an unusual location at the moment the gun was fired, or at a moment the gun was fired. Before 
we leave your slides, I do want to ask you a little follow-up. This photo here, this is one of the photos that was in evidence, is that correct? Yes, that's a photo of the exterior, this location, but on the outside. And what do these trajectory rods, what do they tell you about the direction or the orientation of the bullets? Um, this is just one photo. There are other photos that do show the interior and show other elements of bullet path. So, for example, um, if I have a shot fired through two structures, I can connect those two dots and form a line. That will give me an approximation of the bullet's path through those items. Um, there were other structures inside the, the structure here that you can't see in these photos. But the individual rods are meant to show the approximate trajectory of the bullets that made the bullet holes. Uh, they're, they're pushed through. And in this case, you can see one is very close to the floor because the floor is essentially this level here. And these other two are slightly higher and diverge slightly. Now, I can't give accurate measurements because I don't have photos that will allow me to measure directly. And as far as I know, direct measurements were not obtained. Um, but what this does tells me are these are low shots that are either slightly ascending, uh, which could be indicative of a ricochet, or from a low position firing out. And then these, this lower one here, again, same thing, could have hit something uh, on the way in at a low angle and just be traveling low, or maybe on a ricochet upward. Now, Mr. Brudenell, <clears throat> there's been testimony in this case regarding uh, the distance of the gunshot wounds, or the distance of the gun to the gunshot wounds. Yes. Um, are you familiar with that testimony? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, if it was something I heard today, I'm remembering only what I've reviewed in the medical examiner's um, documentation. Okay, so you reviewed the uh, medical investigator's report? Correct. Okay. And the doctor testified last week that the shot to the head was at an intermediate range. Yes. What does that mean to you as a forensic scientist specializing in shooting reconstruction? To me, and generally speaking, I think throughout the field, intermediate means that it was close enough to see residues. So residues from the shot being fired, some of the residues we discussed today. Um, but not close enough that it was in contact. Um, a wound, especially the skin, at a contact distance produces some very characteristic damage to the tissue that separates it from a shot fired from a distance. <clears throat> Um, an intermediate means it was close enough to leave some residues, um, but not close enough to actually be in contact. Um, the other has aspect of this was the, the absence of residues identified on the wound to the body, but that location was covered with clothing, so the residues that may have been present could have been on the clothing and intercepted by that. So the fact that there wasn't gunshot residue located on the body can you make an accurate determination regarding distance without more analysis? Um, you may not be able to make an accurate determination of distance, and you would do it with either shot separately probably, but I would say that it is possible that both shots could have been from a similar distance, not to the wounds themselves, but to the body in general, which is to say, if I'm bent forward facing somebody, and I'm gonna do this right now, the head may be closer to the gun than the chest. So two shots fired in a parallel path might produce residues on the face or the head, but not produce them on the body. Because at that angle, those individual surfaces are different distances away. And specifically regarding the gunshot to the chest, that would be a scenario where gunshot residue analysis might be helpful? Um, it could be helpful in either case. Um, I can't speak to every um, combination of investigators and labs and agencies, but traditionally um, wounds to the skin are evaluated by the medical examiner for distance. Um, they may use uh, forensic scientists at the crime lab for test fire generation or other resources. Uh, shots to clothing are often delivered directly to the laboratory for analysis by them. So it really depends on the, the surface that struck and the organizations involved in the investigation and the forensic analysis. And being as how you work in a crime lab, you work with law enforcement. Um, in your experience, who typically is responsible for determining what type of forensic testing to do? 
in most cases, the either investigator involved in the initial investigation would make the determination. They essentially issue or give to the laboratory with the evidence what they call a laboratory request. So they're requesting the analysis they want done. Um, they may or may not want DNA or fingerprints collected from an item, but they may want it tested, such as a gun, for operability. Um, uh, they know the case better usually than anyone at the lab because the lab is a service organization. Um, in some cases, depending on the on the uh, the type of case, those, if it's going to trial, those requests may also come from the prosecuting attorneys, for example. And in some cases, even defense attorneys will weigh in with a request for analysis. Now, Mr. Brudenell, do you still have the firearm up there? Yes, I do. Could you take a closer look at it, please? Can you look on that firearm and see if there's any sort of dried residue or spatter? Yes, um, and it's difficult to visualize, but what I'm seeing here are um, a number of, I would call, call them essentially gray spots, small tiny spots, and in some cases slightly larger ones on the opposite side. Um, they, they look almost like uh, water spots look on, say, a dark surface if the, you know, the water evaporates and you see a little bit of the, the calcium residue behind. Is that blood? Uh, it doesn't look like blood to me. Um, in the initial photographs that I saw, it appeared fresher and more wet, and I thought there was a possibility it could be blood. Um, but at this point, I wouldn't, I wouldn't guess that it's blood based on visualizing it. Could it be gun oil? Uh, I guess it could be, and I can't be certain that it's not blood without some testing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really know what it is. Could it be mace? Possibly. So without further testing, it's hard to be certain what it is. That's correct. And are you aware if there are any uh, laboratories that can do testing to determine if something has been sprayed with mace? Um, my understanding is there are a number of laboratories that could do that. Um, it's not a common uh, analysis that you see in most uh, routine crime laboratories but there are specialty laboratories that do all sorts of chemical analysis, so I suspect it could be done. Now, Mr. Brudenell, um, given your review of all of the evidence, uh, do you have any opinions about whether there could have been a struggle that occurred at the time of the shooting? Um, individual aspects of what I've reviewed point that direction, um, the, the damaged and removed scope covers, the varied trajectory angles, and also the fact that the majority of the trajectory impacts I've seen appear to have a shallow impact. Um, the, the fact that these residue patterns indicate the firearm was upside down and in contact or likely close contact with the, with the flooring when it was fired for two of those shots, um, all of this independently suggests uh, a struggle. I can't think of a, a more likely scenario uh, to describe that combination of events. Thank you. Thank you. We pass the witness. Let's take a 10 minute recess at this time. All right. All right. I think 10 
Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I have some questions for you. Certainly. Um, so we did a pre we did two pretrial interviews, correct? That's correct. Yes, via I think Zoom or something of that nature. It was a video conference. Yes, it was a video conference, and I believe they were a couple weeks apart. I recall. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. So the first time that I interviewed you was October 6, 2022, correct? I don't re recall the exact date, but that sounds about right. About a month ago. Yeah. Um, and when I interviewed you, I asked you what discovery you had reviewed. And at that point, you had reviewed the OMI report. So. Yes. Um, photographs. Yes. And some police reports. I believe so, yes. Okay. But you had not reviewed all of the discovery yet at that point, correct? Yes, and I would say I rarely get the opportunity to review everything. For one, it takes a tremendous amount of time, and also it's hard for me to look at every single item of documentation and know what the value is without starting through it all. Okay. And you did not write a report of any kind in this case, is that correct? Well, that is correct. Okay. Um, now, when I interviewed you on October 6th, you told me that you had two opinions. The first being that the evidence supports a struggle for the gun, which is what you testified today, correct? Correct. And the second opinion that you had formed was that Mr. Audiola was shot from a low position, likely from the corner of a room. Is that correct? That's what it appeared to me at the time, yes. Okay. Now, we also talked about trajectory and scene reconstruction and that it's more of a like what's more likely or less likely based on what the evidence says. Is that right? Yes, and as I said, we try to find ways to compare scenarios and have reasons to rule one in or rule one out or have reasons to describe one as more or less likely. Okay. And I, I think that the best scenario, the way you put it, at least in your interview, was that this isn't like the Scooby-Doo show where you finally figure out what happened and in what sequence. That's correct. You don't get to the end of the story and a full telling of exactly what happened and when. Okay. And obviously you weren't there that day. Correct. Um, and so you don't know, you're reading the evidence, if you will. That's correct. Okay. And only Mr. Adiola and Mr. Cummings know exactly what happened that day. That's probably a fair statement. In fact, I would even say that uh, participants in an, in an event often don't get the full picture because an intense event like a shooting uh, or a fight can affect a person's perception and memory. So as a general rule, I do use testimonial evidence when it's available and I find it useful, but more often than not, I try to focus only on the physical evidence because that's stuff that can be tested um, and evaluated, uh, hopefully, um, impartially. Okay, so let's talk about your opinion that there was a struggle, okay? Yes. Um, in a firearm like the one that we have here in this case, I don't know if you have it up there with you. Yes, it's right here. Um, how is a round chambered in a rifle like this? Um, in a rifle of this type, there's usually a, what we call a charging handle, some kind of operating control on the outside of the gun. Can you stand up and show the jury what you're talking about? <coughs> yes. Um, in this case, the operating control is right here. It has sort of a shape to conform to a person's finger, for example. So to charge this gun, if you had a magazine seated in the magazine well, you would pull this to the rear and then release it. Okay, and then a round would be in the chamber then? Yes, if everything's functioning properly, um, a round would be taken from the magazine and put into the chamber in preparation for firing. 
if there was something in the chamber at that moment when the action is pulled open, what, what's in the chamber will typically be removed. So if I had a round in the chamber and a magazine seated and cycled it, you would find a live cartridge coming out of the gun and then another live one fed from the magazine into the chamber. Okay. So what you just described, having to pull the, the pin back, I think you called it. Uh, charging pin. Charging pin, pin yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'm not good with these that's terminologies. Um, that's an affirmative action that would add time to somebody who wants to shoot that rifle. Is that correct? Um, it's a process that requires um, an action. Um, that action will require some amount of time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the scene. I'm sure you've reviewed all of the photographs. I believe. Okay. So you told me that one of your opinions is that the struggle occurred in the bedroom and possibly the hallway. Do you remember that? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. So I'm going to put what's been admitted as State's Exhibit 45 under the document camera. Yes. Zoom out, sorry. Okay. I can see it. Okay. So were there any projectiles documented in this wall behind the bunk bed? Or any impacts, I'm sorry, um, terminology? I don't recall seeing any. Um, having not visited the scene, there's no way to know if there were impacts there that weren't documented. Um, but I didn't see any documentation of impacts there. Okay. And actually, let's use the photo from your demonstrative. I think that would be easier. And this is page 9? Yes. Okay. So that would be this wall, correct? Correct. I'll mark it here. Okay. And as far as you know, there is no impact documented to that wall? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. And was there was no impact documented to this wall, is that correct? Also correct. Okay. Was there any impact documented to this wall? Um, there was a single impact in the wall at the very low area, which was basically the door jam. The door is not accurately represented here, but it's approximately in that location. So there was one shot that was to the door jam, which would be sort of the part of the hallway just adjacent to the doorway. Right here? Yes, approximately there. Yes. Um, well, you can't see it here. It was in a different photograph. Essentially, go back to that one if you moment, for a moment. It would be in this area right approximately here, slightly above the view of that photograph. Oh, there it is. You can see it. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> if you had it there. Sorry. Okay. I'll clear but that's this. not in the bedroom, correct? No, leading out. Okay. So there were no impacts documented on this wall then. Is that correct? I believe so. Well, none that I saw. Okay. So we can agree there's no impacts on this wall? Correct. This wall? Correct. Or this wall? Correct. So can we assume that the gun was not fired in any of those directions? Um, directionality is tricky because there are two directions. There's the top-down view that we're talking about here, but there's also a downward angle view. Um, okay. And so I can't be certain if there weren't impacts, one, that weren't recorded or two impacts that might have been going in those directions um, that were at an angle such that the bullet didn't actually make it to the wall. So a bullet striking the floor, for example, or for that matter, one that went into the ceiling if it wasn't observed. Um, those wouldn't make it to the wall either. You also had testified on direct examination about some of the, the best practices in doing scene reconstruction and trajectory and things like that. You said that trajectory analysis would be one of the best practices, is that correct? Um, yes, I think that's a fair statement. I, I don't usually use the phrase best practices, and maybe I did in this case, <laughs> but it's one of the things that can be done, and there are certain ways to do it. Um, in, in some cases, there's no need to do it. Um, in a case like this, I felt it uh, useful. Okay, and I, I apologize, you said perfect scenario. Fair Not enough. best practices. Okay. I've used just, that term before. I just. Yeah. Just to be clear, you <laughs> said perfect scenario. So you also said that in the perfect scenario, you would have measurements. Correct. Um, and when I interviewed you, um, you stated that it, measurements weren't important in this case. Is that correct? Um, 
I don't remember the exact contents if I made that statement, um, but I would say for the purposes of evaluating whether or not there was a struggle, I felt I had enough information to, to draw that conclusion from a variety of facts. Okay. Um, I think what would have been more interesting or useful would be to do connections of some of these trajectories. Um, it would be nice to know if it's possible that the three shots exiting the structure could have been continuations, say, of the three shots through the door. Mm -hmm. That could have been done with measurements, possibly. Could have also right. been done in other ways. And I think that the questions I asked you when we had done the interview was, did you measure the gun? Did you measure the room? Correct. And things of that nature. And you said that those types of measurements were not important, correct? To, to, to the best of my knowledge, they wouldn't be. And I would say that only in the context that without other measurements to tie them to, I can't make use of sort of half of an equation. Okay. So... You testified on direct examination about the broken cap gun. And I'll just use your photos since we have them here in handy. This is page 16 on your demonstrative aid. And you have it circled on your little photo there. Yes. Um, you testified that this may be indicative of a struggle, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, but, and in your interview, you told me that these types of things aren't, tip, aren't super robust. Do you remember that? Um, I may, yeah, that sounds like the way I would have put it. Um, if I can elaborate, the this scope cover, the part that goes around the scope, is of a flexible rubber that's designed to stretch and fit over the, the front of the scope. Okay, and um, you said that this is something that can be easily broken if you are carrying the gun and you bang into something. Those are possibilities too, yes. Um, what if it wasn't actually attached to the gun but it was taped with electrical tape? Would it be easier to fall off? If it was actually taped, I would think it would be it would depend on whether easier or harder is difficult to evaluate without a fit. Absolutely. Tape might actually make it easier if it was taped on the outside. Typically, the tape would be used on the inside to sort of expand the diameter so it fits tighter, kind of like putting a thicker sock on your foot before putting a shoe on, making a tighter fit. Is it typical to use electrical tape to put on a cap? Um, I've seen it done in the past. I would say more often than not, if you have access to a variety of sizes, you get the one that fits the best but oftentimes you have what's available and to make it fit, you might do that. And in scenarios, if we're talking, I don't know how to reset this. Do you have the reset button there? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you don't know, though, whether or not this cap was actually there before the homicide or not, correct? That's not something you can say. Oh, that's true. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about the other impacts. Would you agree that the other impacts that were documented on scene were low impacts in an upward trajectory? Um, a number of them were, and specifically um, the ones that exited the structure uh, with the three trajectory rods that you could see in the photograph on the outside. Um, I can't be absolutely certain about the upward trajectory without a really good perspective photo or without measurements. But looking at the combination of them and multiple photos, that's what it appeared to be. And I'm putting underneath the document camera states exhibit 68. This is a photograph of the bedroom, correct? Yes. Um, where would the shooter likely have been when Mr. Audiolo was shot? Um, I guess I would say there are two possibilities that make sense to me. Um, the one that initially seemed the most logical would be a shooter somewhere in this vicinity um, based on the fact that the trajectories would more or less correspond to their locations and their path through the body as it fell. Some assumptions based into that would be that all those shots that struck 
the two struck, shots that struck the decedent hit him at the same time, and he was incapacitated immediately thereafter. Um, it is possible that either of those assumptions are not correct. Um, the third shot across grazing the back also corroborates those orientations. Um, the other theory that does uh, fit that I think would be a shooter in this position and descriptions of the body turning slightly as the shots are fired, if it, in fact the torso was facing the shooter and then moments before the shot was fired, turned slightly. And are you saying on the bed or in front of the bed? Um, this is the part that I have no really good way to assign it. Uh, two people standing, one bent forward and charging could have produced those shots, or one person sitting or crouching on or just below the bed, you know, or in front of the bed in a position where the other person is on hands and knees moving towards them, for example. Those are two possibilities. The standing and the height, that I wouldn't be able to resolve from any of this. Would you say then that based on your review of the evidence that the shooter was at an elevated position from the decedent? Um, it is a possibility. Um, what I would say is the orientation of the firearm at those moments, those two or three shots were fired, is consistent with being parallel to the torso. Now whether that means two people are, well, one person is at a position or the gun is at a position at this level, and the body of the decedent is tilted exactly level with it, or that there's a slight variation, the body's tilted most of the way down and the, the firearm is at a slightly elevated position is possible as well. Okay, let's talk about the position of the, dis the body during the shooting. I think that was your second opinion we had talked about in your interview. I, I think I missed the first half of your question, please. Um, let's talk about the body of the decedent since, yes. since we're talking about this now. Um, this was a three-shot grouping in the bedroom? Well, there were um, three shots, two that struck the body and one that grazed the clothing that are all more or less parallel. Okay. And they were right to left? Correct, right to left and downward. Trajectory, okay. And that's based on an anatomical position of a person standing straight up. And can the trajectory of a bullet change inside the body as it hits different organs or different matter within the body? Can the trajectory change? It can, depending on a number of factors, the, the type of projectile, the speed, and the objects in the body that it strikes. Um, my evaluation of that analysis was based strictly on what was reported in the medical examiner. So the medical examiner presumably follows the entire trajectory and describes it as a linear path. Um, presumably if a shot was fired and say hit a rib and changed direction, they would hopefully be able to describe that as well. Okay. Um, now, Mr. Audiola, is it possible that he was on all fours in a crawling position based on the shots to his body? I believe that is possible as well. Is it possible that Mr. Audiola was bent over leaning forward? Yes. And the shooter, based on this position, must have been over or at a higher elevation or than the decedent was, shooting um, downward. It's a possibility and um, one that I think is maybe almost absurd would be if the shooter was at the top bunk firing downward, I would still expect the torso of the decedent when the moment the shots were fired to have been bent forward slightly at least to correspond to that angle. Um, I think this was a hypothetical we talked about, right? Right, I believe so. Where the, no. potentially the shooter's on the top bunk bed, fires one shot and then jumps down and fires two more, correct? Um, the, the problem with that, and I don't want to say right. it's impossible, is that it requires uh, those shots to also continuously parallel themselves after bodies are changing position. Um, it's not impossible, but it it's probably not the most likely scenario. Is it possible that the shooter could be standing on that twin size bed shooting down? Um, there is a possibility, yes. But no measurements of Mr. Cummings or Mr. Audiola were used in any of your analysis, correct? Uh, correct, and there were no measurements available that I'm aware of, except okay. possibly the body height measurement from the medical examiner. 
Just from OMI, correct? They correct. typically correct. take those from they the They routinely yeah, measure, they measure the body position and also the position of the wounds relative to height. Okay, so let's talk about the impacts to the door. <coughs> I'm looking at page 10 of your demonstrative. Yes. Now the impacts to the door and that door and then exiting outside, That was was that likely a three round burst? Um, I wouldn't describe a three round burst because that implies something mechanical about the firearm. It could be three shots fired in succession um, and that would require the single shot passing through the door jam up here to correspond to one of these impacts and for all three of these impacts to correspond to the exits here. Um, it's a reasonable hypothesis that that happened, um, and without seeing the scene and or doing measurements, it would be difficult to verify. It might even be impossible to verify. Okay, because I think that there was also an air conditioner that those shots traveled through, correct? Yes, the interior that I didn't have photographed here but did see photographs of, the inside of this wall had a, an air conditioner, some device, some mechanical operation or apparatus um, in the path of some of those bullets. Okay. So in regards to the hallway impacts, and I'm talking about page 14 here. Now, yes. could I B, A, and I, A, could those be like continuations of the projectile, um, like ricochets? The po there is a possibility that that some, and I'll even go so far as to include nine, some of these could potentially relate to those other trajectories. Um, it's, it's difficult to be certain with the information available, and it may not be determined if we had all the time in the world and all the resources to investigate the scene. Um, but one of the possibilities would be those shots traveling together, ricocheting off the floor, and then proceeding off as a departure angle to produce those other impacts. That's a possibility. Would you also include I-14? Um, probably not, and only because I-14 is further down the hallway. The impacts, I think, were all here and here um, relative to this diagram. Um, so that doesn't seem to fit. So it couldn't ricochet off the wall or the metal door and then hit the flooring there? Uh, this was a downward impact, and as far as I can recall, um, all of the ones with the arrows are what I would call primary impacts. What that means is that's the first spot the bullet hit. And the reason I would say that is the bullet appeared to be stable. The initial impact site had a symmetrical shape to it. Once the bullet loses its stability, however, it starts to tumble. Now the path may continue, but the orientation of the bullet in space as it's traveling will alter. And so that's why those holes through the door all appeared to have uh, non-circular impact shapes. So. That's kind of better for 14. Sure. And I'm putting States Exhibit 87 under the document. Is this 14? Yes. And this is a good example. What we have here is an impact location starting there, and where the damage that's really obvious tends to be downrange of that impact. Um, and so as the bullet's coming in, it's traveling this direction, and it's striking in a nose forward stable orientation. This is likely the primary impact. So the first thing that this bullet hit was this area of the flooring. Now it could ricochet from here and possibly even divert slightly, but generally speaking, the departure would be along this line, which would separate it from the angles of the others. Now that said, this line may converge with some of the other lines that we've talked about, producing, say, shots into the door and exiting the structure. So all of them could converge at one location and be part of the same shooting sequence and position. But I wouldn't associate 14 with the other shots in terms of continuing trajectories. Okay, so let's talk.
talk about the muzzle pattern. And I'm putting it in the document camera, see if you get 51. So a flash hider, I think when we talked about, you said is used to separate the burning components at the muzzle and reduce or eliminate the flash. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and that flash is a ball of fire. Typically, yeah. If there's no flash hider, you see a really nice, bright, you know, football or basketball shaped flash. Okay. Um, would continuous shooting, like 11 times, make that barrel pretty hot? Uh, it could, yes. Okay. So it would be hot to the touch. It may be. Yeah. It would depend on ambient temperature. Um, 11 shots is enough that it would certainly warm it up. Would it be too hot to the touch? I don't know. Okay. And um, <coughs> can we agree that there were 11 fired casings recovered here? That's the information I got from the lab report uh, that the state lab um, produced. Okay. But there could be potentially more or less because they just recovered what was on scene. That's also a possibility, yes. Okay. Now, when I interviewed you, and I believe that you testified on direct examination, that you believed the gun was being forced downward and upside down. Correct. Is that correct? How do you know it's being forced downward? Couldn't it just be held in that position? Um, I'd say that's a possibility, too. Um, I'm trying to think of a reason anyone would intentionally hold the gun in that orientation, and I can't come up with one. So my most logical assumption is that it was being forced down during a struggle. Okay, so that's your assumption, but we'd, I mean, someone could potentially just hold the gun in that position and fire it two times. Yes, and that's exactly what I did with my test shots. I just held the gun there, deliberately upside down, fired, fired. Well, I didn't, a friend of mine did. And just to be clear, you can't age impacts, is that correct? Oh, that is correct. It's almost impossible to um, sequence even shots like this moments apart or even shots that are separated by a long distance in time. There's some exceptions to that, but for the most part, um, shots fired days apart will look the same depending on the target. Okay, so because you can't age impacts um, with scientific certainty, correct, that it's possible that those marks were there before the homicide? Yeah, it's a possibility. Yeah. Is it possible that the marks were put there after the homicide? I suppose that's a possibility too. Okay, so let's talk about your test fires. Um, I interviewed you again on October 27th, correct? Yes, I believe so. And when I initially interviewed you on October 6th, you had not done any test fires, correct? That's correct. You had formed your opinion, but you had not done any test fires yet to support your opinion, correct? Uh, not in the combinations that we've seen today. I'd done other shooting that did validate my opinion, but it, I felt it was prudent to do more. Okay, but so you did your test fires. Would you remember what day you did them? Um, I don't recall specifically. Um, I could probably look at photos and ages of the photos and get that information from you, but I don't remember. Okay. But it wasn't done on October 6th? No, no, no. It was definitely done days or weeks later. Okay. And you told me at that time that every gun, and I think you said that on direct too, every gun and ammunition combination is very different in how the residues appear. Um, I should say it can be different. If I said very, that was a misstatement on my part. But um, it is possible to have the same gun with different ammunition and see different results. It's also possible to have the same ammunition and different guns and see different results. Okay, and I'm putting it underneath the document camera. We can agree that the top gun was the gun that was collected from the homicide scene. Correct. And I believe the bottom gun is the gun that you used for your <coughs> test fires, correct? That is correct. Um, obviously, visually, we can see that this has a larger scope. Correct. Right. Um, but you didn't use any measurements, correct, in your test fires? Any measurements of the gun that was used as a, opposed to the gun in your test fires? So the measurements that I could rely on, I didn't necessarily measure them, but I knew the barrel length was 16 inches, well, technically to here, mm -hmm. um, because that's how this rifle was built. Uh, the resources I could find showed the barrel length here, and this model was 16 inches, and I looked at images of various gun types, and that's the, that, that was visually what this appeared to be. These photos may not be at the same scale, so the fact that this distance doesn't match this just means the cameras were at different depths. Um, 
I would say what are more significant differences maybe than the barrel length, uh, because those appear to be the same, would be the fact that uh, the Air 15 rifle here, the gas travels all the way down an open tube to cycle the action during firing. So there's more gas produced and delivered into the action here, whereas this firearm has a piston, so the gas only travels a short distance and drives a piston to the rear. It's a different mechanical operation, and that may or may not produce differences in the residue patterns. That was actually my next question, oh. sir. So you, Thank you. <laughs> already answered that. Um, you also testified about the different types of flooring materials. Could that affect your test fires? Um, it is a possibility um, to try to simulate the flooring material from the actual shooting incident. All I had to go on was photographs. I took those photographs to a flooring supply store, um, verified their opinion, matched mine, which was the laminated wood product flooring. But there's a variety of types of those, a variety of thicknesses. Um, I used two different types of material based on what I found that was available. I chose colors that more or less match the flooring here. Um, but there's a variety of variables, and the ideal scenario to try to absolutely duplicate this would be to use the same firearm, the same ammunition, and if not identical samples of that flooring, actual sections of the flooring itself that hadn't been damaged. Okay. I also felt that for the most part, illustrating what I saw as significant didn't require that extra level of precision, so I wasn't too concerned that that wasn't available to me. Okay, and when I interviewed you on October 6th, you said that the measurements didn't really contribute to your opinion, correct? That's correct. Um, and the, the weight of the firearm also didn't contribute to your opinion, correct? Yes, that's also correct. Um, so let's talk about the differences between the two, between the one in the incident and then the one in your test fires. We can see that it has a different fixed iron sight, correct? Correct. What is the size difference? That I don't know, um, and what I can tell you is looking visually at, say, the angle produced from the muzzle to the top of the front sight appeared similar to me. Um, again, I didn't measure the angles, um, and I didn't have the opportunity to inspect this particular firearm. I did make an attempt to find the same make and model, but was unsuccessful. Um, I'm sure they're out there. I just they're, they're less common than the AR-15 rifles that I had access to. Would you agree that this one in your test fire appears to be longer in length? Uh, the barrel isn't any longer. Do you, what are you referring the to? The fixed iron sight. Um, I don't really know. I don't have a measurement. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in your test fires, you laid this firearm directly onto the flooring sample, correct? Yes. So it was contact at the fixed iron sight. Uh, yes. I did several shots prior to that. Um, at different distances and angles, but the ultimately the two that I used to try to most simulate what was seen at the scene was a contact shot where the floor sample was in this orientation. In direct contact, excuse me, with the muzzle, man, I can't draw a straight line today, sorry. Mm -hmm. The muzzle, the tip of the muzzle and the top of the front sight. Okay. And I, in your interview on October 27th, you stated that that would probably be the most significant measurement was the rifle you used with the fixed iron sight to the? Um, that might have been the most significant measurement to have, but I would say my assumption is that differences in ammunition and probably differences in the gas system might produce greater differences in the actual residue patterns produced. I okay. can't be certain about either of those, but that's my assumption. Okay, and would the size of this scope affect the angles in any way? In this case, I don't believe so, because the angle produced in this case goes above that of the, of the scope itself. And when I place the rifle here, lying in that orientation, the scope doesn't make contact when those two points do. Now it's possible that there was a shallower angle and it might have interacted with this as well, which might have been another limitation, but I, I simply didn't have opportunity to test that. Would that have added weight as well to the firearm? Weight? Weight, uh, like heaviness? The scope itself? Yes. Would that yes, have added weight? Would, yes, the scope would be make it heavier. Okay. It's a heavier gun anyway, I think. And I believe you testified on direct examination that the rifle used in the homicide could have been less than three inches from the ground. Is that correct? 
Um, that's what my notes state. Yes, you. that sounds about right. Okay. Um, and that's what would have likely produced those patterns in the flooring. Correct. Okay. Now, you talked a little bit about the ammunition. Um, what was the difference in the ammunition? Um, as far as I know, the only difference was a manufacture date of about five years. Um, it's the same product, if you will. It's a military spec specified mil spec product, so it's probably very consistent. But there's no way to be sure if they didn't change powder sources or formulations across that five year period of time. And was the grain count the same? Uh, the bullets are the same. You mean the powder charge or the yes. bullet? Yes. Uh, I wouldn't know with the powder charge whether it was the same weight or the same type of powder. That I, I don't have that information available. Could um, that affect the muzzle pattern? Yes, could, yes. Okay, what about the magazine? Did you take that into account when you did your test fires? Uh, no, um, and I don't think the magazine would have any impact on those patterns because the moment of firing is a very instantaneous moment. The magazine would only relate to cycling, so I can't see how it would relate. It would, it would interact with these data. What about someone's ability to hold it upside down if it's a 30-round magazine? Um, again, if it's upside down, the magazine's upward, so it may or may not have any re relation to how it's being held. What about weight? Would it add weight to the um, firearm? It could add a little bit of weight in either yeah. case. Um, let's talk about the size of the room. Actually, let's still stay on the impact. This is stage exhibit 51. You talked a little bit about signs of a struggle. Did you take into account the items that are hanging on the wall if there were a struggle in this room? Um, I did not. I had no way of knowing if those items were there all along or if they had been dislodged during the event. Okay. I'm pushing the same photograph downward. And it appears that there's a mirror <clears throat> leaning against the wall, correct? I see that. Have you ever been in a mobile home before? Many times, yes. Okay. Are the walls pretty flexible in a mobile home? I think it depends on their construction. Um, I've been in perfectly built single family housings that have flexible structures too. <laughs> okay. Now, let me ask you another question. And I don't know how far this can zoom in, but we can try. Is it likely that this could have been a ricochet on Mr. Adiola's boot? Um, I can't really make a, a, an educated call based on this photo and the resolution. Okay. Um, Let me, um, would it be better to view it on a digital screen? Perhaps? It might be. Um, while you were zooming in, I saw something on the wall though that looked like it could be an impact. One. I don't know, it won't let me. It's on my screen. Loretta, can you help me? Oh, here we go. You gotta go to the side. That's the trick here. Is 
the digital photograph a better photograph? It definitely is a better photograph. <laughs> Less pixelated. Um, is it likely that that could potentially be a ricochet impact, or is it possible that it could potentially be a ricochet impact on Mr. Audiolo's boot? Um, I think you're referring to this spot here. Is that correct? or are No, on the toe. The toe there. Yes, sir. Um, I suppose it is possible. Um, very difficult to tell from this viewing. Uh, I would certainly want to inspect the boot itself. Um, when you were zooming in, I saw this, and this looked like a likely bullet impact as well that could have been a ricochet. So it might be in the same vicinity. Um, this particular impact, if it was an impact, um, uh, could also come from another part of a struggle if there's a downward shot fired. Okay. Could it potentially come from a downward shot from this muzzle mark that way? Um, I would say a possibility could exist. There's two problems. Um, the first is um, it's unclear, and in my testing at 20 degrees, the shots that entered at that angle typically went through the floor. Um, now, the ones that you saw in the video came back out because the floor was on the soil and it ricocheted off of that surface, but the ones that were shot at 20 degree angle from the apparatus went clean through. So first, we would have to verify that a ricochet occurred. Right. Um, the other problem I see is this is very shallow. So for this to occur, that departure angle would have to be skimming the floor surface. And um, I haven't done ricochet studies on these, this type of material to know, mm -hmm. but very often wood is what we call a yielding surface. So the ricochet, the departure angles tend to be more substantial than would produce an impact like that at this angle as we see it in the image. I would expect a higher hit somewhere <coughs> up if that were a ricochet and a departure angle on wood. But to be fair, I have not tested this particular type of material for okay. ricochet departure angles. So it could ricochet up and potentially be up here? Is that a possibility? Yeah, Sorry. possibility, sure. There's a glare up here that I can't quite see. Okay. I'm trying to clear it, and I think it's not, not letting me. There we go. Um, when I interviewed you, sir, you also told me that there could potentially be a three to five degree variance with angle measurements. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and it's widely accepted that anytime you do a measurement, like for a trajectory rod going through a structure, you can't rely on your measurements to be 100% accurate in all circumstances. So as a general rule, when those uh, measurements are recorded, there's a presumption or even a little description that the measured angle could be anywhere from three to five degrees either way. Now, in the Scooby-Doo show, you said that you can read the evidence and maybe decide what likely happened, correct? Sure. <laughs> this is State's Exhibit 62. Now, the majority of the spent casings were along this wall, correct? I believe so, yes, in the general vicinity where those um, uh, green markers are. Okay. However, there was one casing, and I'm putting under the document camera case exhibit 45. Let me see if zooming in helps. There was one documented casing partially under the bunk bed, correct? Yes, I see that. Um, what side of the bat firearm do spent casings expel from? Should I pick it up? And yes, sir, please um, show the jury. The ejection port on the firearm is right here where my fingers are. So the cartridge cases will come out of this side of the gun at some point. Now, they may come out at a 
you know, an angle forward or back, they may go up or they might go straight out. It's hard to be sure without testing the gun. Okay, and for purposes of the record, from the shooter, you're pointing towards the right side. That's correct. Typically, most generic ejection patterns are to the right and slightly to the rear. Rifles tend to vary a little more than that. I've seen a number of rifles eject forward as well. Is, does it matter if you're right-handed or left-handed? Is that why? Um, it can matter <laughs> if you're left-handed, for example, and you're holding it in orientation where your head or face is in the path. But often and not, as not, it doesn't happen that way. Okay. So if the firearm was upside down, then the spent casing would expel to the left side of the shooter if you were holding the gun, correct? Um, yes. If I was holding the gun like this, casings would come out this way towards me. Okay. So would we expect to see two spent casings at least in this room on this side of the room? Um, there's a possibility you would see that. Okay. Um, I would certainly have tried to look for two, knowing what I know now. Okay. But there's also a possibility that... They can be moved, they can be kicked. Correct. They can roll, correct? Exactly, exactly. Or they could impact, I mean, a casing could have impacted the metal bed frame and bounced back and landed in the corner with the rest. Um, and likewise, this cartridge case here could have bounced from one of the other shots and landed there as well. Now I'm putting underneath the document camera States Exhibit 46. And I believe this was identified as number 12 in the state police report. And that's a spent casing on that plastic bin, correct? I believe so. Does that tell you a piece of the story? Uh, again, same answer basically. <laughs> it's these ejection cartridge cases are coming out of the gun with a certain amount of force. There's lots of walls and objects they can hit and bounce. So I wouldn't make any attempt to interpret that location beyond that shot was probably fired in this room. Okay. Can you say that that bin was there at the time of the shooting? Um, based on this photo, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I believe there was blood evidence on the uh, bin. And it appears to correspond to the location I've seen where the blood has pooled, say, at the bottom. I've seen in other photos. Okay, so it's likely that that plastic tub was in the room, correct? Yeah, that's reasonable, yes. And especially since there's a spent casing on the top of it. Correct. 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 Um, and that lid is partially open? Uh, looks to be, yes. Um, but you can't tell any information where the shooter was when that spent casing ejected from the gun, correct? No, I, I wouldn't risk it. Um, during your interview, we talked about, and on direct examination, we talked about the OMI and the different distances that the doctor had determined the, the shots to the body were. Correct. So the shot to the head was determined to be intermediate, correct? Yes. And that's because there was stippling? Um, I don't recall the exact description, but there were some kind of gunshot residues indicative of a close range discharge, but not a compact shot. Okay. And then the shot to the chest was determined to be distant, correct? That's correct. Although I believe the determination was made strictly off an examination of the body. Um, any analysis of the clothing may have been superficially done, but that type of analysis for distance usually involves the crime lab and often uh, magnification, microscopes, and or chemical testing. Could the difference in distances, is there a possibility that it could come from someone walking towards the shooter? Uh, that could be a possibility, yes. Or the shooter walking towards the person being shot? Yes. Sorry, I apologize. I think I was answering those questions in reverse order, but the answer is <laughs> the same. Yes. All right. So, in your opinion that there was likely a struggle, did you take into account the size of this room? Um, it was a small room, um, but I think you can have a struggle in a very small space. Okay. So, Agent Herrera had testified he was in this room for eight hours processing the scene. He's the one who did the rods and documented everything. He said he believed the room was about eight by ten. Okay. Okay. Can you show the ju jury what an 8x10 room looks like by taping it out? 
on the floor in the courtroom? I'll say if you have a tape measure, I could do that. I do. Certainly. Fantastic, sir. Thank you, sir. So, for purposes of the record, we have taped out what would be an 8 by 10 room yes. for the jury's visualization. Now, this room also had a twin size bed, correct? I don't know the exact dimensions of the bed. Um, right. So, I, I, you're that's the analysis is as good as mine. Do you believe this to be a twin size bed? I'm afraid I really don't know. Okay. And there's also some bunk beds in there too, right? Yes. And there was a plastic bin flush with the bed, correct? Yes. So that would have left very little room for a struggle, correct? No, that's correct. If we're looking at this, let me find the photograph, I think it was 31, 51. And we're talking again about these muzzle pattern marks, correct? Mm -hmm. Would it like, is it possible, let me rephrase that, is it possible that the rifle would have hit the wall, being that it was such a small room with some kickback from the firearm? I think it is possible, if not likely, that one of the shots, more likely even than not this one, that the length of the rifle may have made contact with the wall here. It's possible both of them could have done it, but I think the one that's got the sort of more dramatic angle in this image and was closer to the wall could have made contact with the wall. Let me just make sure I got everything, sir. One minute. In 
this small room, um, if there was the possibility of a struggle for the, for the gun, is it possible to crab walk holding that firearm and using the other hand to fight someone off? I, I don't, I think of crab walk and I have an image in my head of what that means. Um, my image may or may not be what everyone else thinks of. I think it's possible for a struggle to happen in this confined space. Crab walking may be part of that physical activity. Um, I guess I'll stop there. Okay. While holding that, how, how much do you think that firearm weighs? I would say approximately nine pounds. It's hard to be certain. Okay. May I have a moment, Judge? Yeah. I did think of one other question, and I'm going to use your demonstrative. This is page 17 <clears throat> of the aid that you provided. Yes. Um, you said that these potentially could be burns. Um, I wouldn't describe them as burns. I would call them um, residue patterns similar to those produced on the surface of, of the flooring, uh, which means that they're not burns, but they're uh, dark sooty residues coming from close range uh, contact with a source. Is it likely for those things to come off if someone washes their hands with soap and water? Um, it, they will come off to a certain extent, but it will depend on how much scrubbing you do. I've had them persist to the point that I'm washing my hands normally longer than you would for routine hand washing. And um, can you get those marks from holding the gun in a regular fashion like you showed us on direct examination? Um, I don't know for certain. There may be a possibility that if gas vents through the holes in the bottom that that could occur. Um, I think it's not likely because I don't think they would put vents here if it would routinely scorch, not scorch, but you know, leave residues on the hands, but it is a possibility. Um, there are other gaps where gas can come out. Um, my first thought was the ejection port, possibly the magazine well if there's gases coming out there or maybe somewhere around this vicinity. But without testing, it's, it's basically just uh, speculation on my part of where those residues could come out of this gun. And I can't be certain that these residues are what we're describing. They could be, those dark spots could be dark from somebody, you know, shaking hands or changing oil. It could be anything. Some touching something dirty like a car tire. It could come from anything, right? Yes. So we don't know what that is. Correct. For sure, anyway. Um, sir, what do you charge an hour for your expertise? Um, it depends on the type of case. Uh, my regular rate is $215 per hour. Um, I have different rates for different clients and casework depending on specific circumstances. Okay. What will you be paid in total for your testimony in this case? In um, total? For my testimony, just the duration I'm here. Um, uh, I don't have my invoice complete at this point. I honestly don't know. And I, the most of my time is spent work up to and, to and prior to this testimony. So how much do you anticipate making for your testimony in this case, or for your testimony and your preparation and your interviews and everything, all the work you've done in this case? Uh, I really don't have a number. Um, uh, I, I can't think of, um, I really don't know what it finally would be. I can tell you I spent all day driving yesterday and then several hours preparing the night, last night. Um, and when I added that day up, it was under 2,000, but very close. And that was for a very long day of working on this case. And then you did work subsequent to driving and testifying today uh, before well, that, prior right? To, prior, yes. 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 How many hours do you think you've put in on this case? I, I honestly don't remember. I, 
I okay. apologize. All right. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Mr. Brudenell, did you see any uh, measurements of the bedroom in any of the evidence? No, I did not. So this 8 by 10 tape that the prosecutor had you mark off on the floor, it, what is that based on? I believe it was based on an estimate by the investigator who, who surveyed the room. Okay. That's what she said. That's what she said, but you didn't actually see measurements? No. Is it possible that room was larger? I suppose so. Okay. We don't know because no one measured it. As far as I know, it wasn't measured. States Exhibit 51. This would be the photograph that the prosecutor showed you of the room, and it shows some things hanging on the wall. Yes. If there's a fight going on down here, what would you expect to happen over here against this wall? Um, I really don't don't have an opinion. All I would say is I can imagine someone colliding into something on the wall or a wall, disrupting that wall and maybe not disrupting another wall at the same time. Um, the and, dynamic. and if the fight is occurring where one person is repeatedly tackling another on the floor, would it be reasonable to believe that maybe nothing would be disturbed over here? I think that's a reasonable possibility, yes. Prosecutor asked you about a mirror that's on the wall. Do you recall that question? Yes. Do you know how that mirror is affixed to the wall? I do not. The prosecutor asked you a series of questions regarding the test firing that you did in this case. Do you recall her asking you about the uh, different guns you used? Uh, yes. And do you recall her asking you about the flooring materials? Correct. And do you ask? Do you recall her asking you about the site on yes. the different guns? All of the above. Yes. If that testing that you conducted had been done by the New Mexico crime lab here, would that be information you could have used? Uh, yes. Would you have need, needed to recreate that testing if? the crime lab here in New Mexico had done it? Most likely not. And is, to be clear, the crime lab in New Mexico is capable of that kind of testing? I believe so. It's a reconstruction type of testing, but it is also a gunshot residue analysis, and I know they've done gunshot residue testing in the past. The prosecutor asked you some questions regarding impact sites 11 and 12. And could you just explain again what impact sites 11 and 12 are? Uh, those are the two that had visual, visible dark scorch marks that corresponded to the ports on the upper part of the flash hider. And just for reference, I'll just publish uh, the diagram you had made. So impact sites 11 and 12 with the scorch marks there. Correct. The prosecutor asked you some questions and basically said, isn't it possible those marks were put there after Mr. Ariola had been shot? I cannot make a distinction between um, shots in time. So as a physical reality, it is a possibility they could have been placed after. And if somebody was placing those impact sites after Mr. Ariola was already deceased, what would they have, have had to do to position themselves to fire those shots? To the best of my knowledge, they would have had to hold the gun upside down in likely direct contact with the floor possibly direct contact with the wall and fire the shots from that position. And would they have had to have been pretty much draped over, over Mr. Ariola's body in order to do that? Possibly, yeah. Well, it's a small room, right? Yeah, I, I don't think of another way that could be done unless they were standing up here somewhere, and even then I don't know if they could reach. 
But the tub's up there. Yeah, that's true. So I guess the person would have had to have lain across the body and fired those shots. Or stood over or crouched over in some way. Or stood over, but they would have had to bend down so that the gun was almost on the floor, correct? Well, I think it would have to be on the floor to a certain extent. I, I, mm -hmm. I, mean, I can't be absolutely certain it was contact, that the gun was in contact, but that fits my testing to the best, uh, best quality. And Exhibit 51 again, the prosecutor asked you some questions regarding some tiny little, almost, uh, some tiny little, I don't even know what to describe that as, mark, smudge, something, on the toe of Mr. Ariola's boot. There appears to be, in this image, yeah. a, a, a slight defect um, in the toe of the boot. Um, whether that's related to any kind of impact or gunshot, I don't know. I've worn boots that get scuff marks on the front and the toe all the time. Um, without even looking at that boot in person, I wouldn't begin to speculate on what it could Right. So those boots, do they look brand new? I really can't be sure from the photo. Fair enough. Yeah. Who could have looked at those boots and made a determination about whether there was some sort of an impact site on them? I believe the state crime lab could have done that. Um, I could have evaluated them as well. What does that look like? Well, the first image, it looks like a possible bullet hole through the wall. Did you see any indications that there, that the police had found that impact site in any of their reports, photos, diagrams? No, but I also can't be certain it's a bullet hole. And maybe a, a direct observation may have made it obviously not. I can't tell from this photo. And just going back to that suggestion by the prosecutor that the scuff mark on the boot was a ricochet, what do you think the likelihood is that that is a ricochet? Um, very unlikely given the position of the body and the material that the ricochet would have had to come from in that position. She also talked to you about the location of casings. Let's see if I can find the photo. There we go. Do you recall the prosecutor showing you this? This is Exhibit 45, State's Exhibit 45. I do. And in particular, the prosecutor asking you questions about this casing right there? Correct. That casing being located there, does it tell you anything? Um, the most I would venture on an opinion is that cartridge case is consistent with having been fired from inside that room. And that's because casings can get kicked? They can be moved um, after the fact, but they can also bounce after, at the moment of firing and land in a variety of locations in a confined space. And would it be possible that if a gun is fired upside down, where impact sites 11 and 12 are located in that room, yes. right? So you have the gun upside down firing almost directly into the floor, and as the prosecutor established, the casings would eject, I guess, to the left. Um, in the direction where this one was, more or less, possibly. And if there was a struggle going on right there, is it possible that someone could have kicked the casing and it landed there? Yes. prosecutor asked you about a series of hypotheticals, one being that the shooter was up on the bunk bed. Yes. What do you think of that possible scenario? Um, it's an unusual location. I wouldn't go so far as to call it absurd or impossible, but it's, it's, it doesn't seem to fit everything else. Um, also, were that the location of a shot fired into the body, the body would still have to be bent substantially at the waist so that the trajectory would correspond to the vertical axis of the, of the torso. How does that shooting, that hypothetical scenario from on top of the bunk bed explain impact sites 11 and 12, the upside down ones on the floor? I don't see any relation. 
the only thing I would say is those other two shots, because the gun was upside down, are most consistent with some kind of struggle when they were fired. And the other hypothetical the prosecutor gave you was that the shooter was standing on the bed or was on the bed. Yeah, I believe, I, in my mind, I imagine crouching or sitting or something of that level on the lower bunk or, or that position. Okay. And how, did, how do those correlate or work with the upside down impact sites 11 and 12? Uh, again, same answer, no relation. They would have to be from a different part of the event. So how likely do you think either of those scenarios are? Um, I think being in or on the lower position of the bed during the midst of a struggle is a possibility. Um, I think while we cannot sequence gunshots specifically, in the context of a struggle, it seems to me more likely that those two shots, 11 and 12, happened during the struggle and the fatal shots occurred sometime after. But I can't be absolutely certain from a forensic physical evidence perspective. Okay. And the prosecutor asked you if you were getting paid for your work in this case. Obviously, you are. Yep. Uh, in your full-time job working for the Arizona Department of Public Safety, are you paid for your, your work in that yes, capacity? I yes, I am. Okay. Do uh, law enforcement officers typically get paid for their work? I believe so, yes. Right. Thank you. No further questions. Okay. You may be excused. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Be careful with that step. Um, would you like me to commit him with the rifle in its condition? Uh, you know what? Yeah, why don't you put it back in the box? Okay. Let me ask you if defense will be calling any other witnesses. No, Your Honor, the defense rests. Okay. Uh, we, we are done for today. Uh, uh, and tomorrow we'll start at 9, at 9.30, not 9 o'clock. Be here about, uh, I'd say about 9.20 or so. And actually, uh, my bailiff is going to escort you into another room. We'll have you wait there until I'm done with I have a hearing at 8.30. So we're, once I'm done with that hearing, we'll bring you in here, all right? So we'll be in recess until tomorrow. <coughs>
Okay. The instructions are are, are good, but I, I need for the state to on, on that step down verdict instruction. Uh, let me give you the numbers that I think are, are appropriate. There's two numbers, 146002A and 146002B. It's real similar to what, what, Ms. Ro what I received, but it's a little bit different. We better go with those, okay? Other than that, I think the instructions are good, the verdict forms are good with, with, uh, with these little uh, minor little things we need to do, okay? I have one question, sure. Your Honor. Um, as far as just formatting. And, and you folks may be seated back there. On the, on the elements instruction, because of the self defense and then the voluntary, do I do one self defense and say it wasn't as a result of self defense or provocation, or do I do it twice? Or what's your preference? I, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. You, you, you'll have the second degree murder or voluntary. And then the self-defense just comes in separate. I, I know, I know, Your Honor. I'm not making myself clear. Yeah. So, you know, in the part of the self-defense instruction, right. we have to add to that element that the defendant did not either did not act as sufficient provocation or did not act as a result of self-defense. Do we do that with two separate instructions or just put it in the same one? Overnight, the, I'm going to. The, this is probably the fourth self-defense murder trial we've done in the last year. I'm going to look at the way that we did the previous jury instructions um, and I'll have an answer. I'm, I can't give an answer right now. Okay. Um, but I agree with the court. I, I think it flows in my recollection of the way that the jury instructions work is uh, it, it, it's pretty straightforward and it flows. So so let me just have a look at, at the way that we've done it in the past, and I can shoot you an email. Yeah, why don't we, I don't care. I just don't yeah. know. And, and, and the reason I'm, I'm, de I'm wanting to deal with those there is one of the worst things, no, I'll say well, there's worse things to do, but one of the things that, that sort of holds up or, or upsets the jury, we're here trying to deal with the jury instruction, and they're just sitting in some, in some room. They're just about all done. I, I said just a matter of cleaning up a few things. Uh, copying them and give, give, giving copies to everyone. If there's no rebuttal, we, we go to jury instruction, closing argument. And if there is rebuttal, it'll probably be pretty short anyway. Yes, sir. So, so uh, why don't you folks try to be here about 8, 8.45, 9 o'clock with whatever you propose on your instruction. And I should be wrapping up that, that sentence in around 9.15 or so, all right? All right, so let's be in recess until tomorrow. If you have things you're going to leave in here, you may just want to put them, uh, especially on your side, okay? You may want to put them over there on, uh, on that table because if, on this little table, on this smaller table here, if you want to leave any of your items, put them on the smaller table because defense counsel tomorrow will be on, on a counsel table, all right? All right, so we'll be in recess until tomorrow. So, like, for example, here. So, here's a step down, okay? And then coming after the step down is defendant killed, knew that his axe. The defendant did not act as a result of sufficient provocation. The defendant did not act in self defense. Does that work? Okay. So, let's kind of plan on that and. Um, 